Gentleness makes a good leader? Gentleness isn't weakness, Bob. It's strength under control. It's a strong hand with a soft touch. It's good for eggs and it's good for people. I'm so sorry for what I did. I was selfish and mean to you. I know. And I forgive you. What? Huh? The selfish son was back with his father again. And the relationship was healed. Because when it comes to relationships, nothing is more powerful than forgiveness. I'm selfish. I hurt you. I chose to desert you. But you were forgiving. And now I feel like living. We both hurt each other. We were mean to one another. But suddenly I'm feeling by forgiving we'll be healing. Forgiveness, the power of forgiveness to overcome the sickness that selfishness and pride always bring. Forgiveness, we all can have forgiveness and now we get to witness how God can help us heal broken things. It's God's way of living. To always be forgiving Our sisters and brothers With love for one another Forgiveness God gives us forgiveness So we can share forgiveness And watch how God can heal broken things Forgiveness Ruth kept caring for Naomi and Boaz kept caring for Ruth. They were showing love the way God designed it, by caring for each other, by putting others first. She shows love to dear Naomi. He shows love to dear Romy. Maybe God wants us together In a brand new family Boaz, I am wondering Well, you grain, I'm plundering God has set our hearts to singing Could those soon be church bells ringing? Well, we don't have churches yet Because we're in the Old Testament And they haven't been invented But... I don't see why not. What our God is now revealing, love is much more than a feeling. This love we are now viewing, not a feeling, but a doing. Not just valentines and wooing, not a feeling, but a doing. This love we are pursuing, not, not a feeling, but... I was stopped by Jerry Boy, who accessorizes sportwear with plungers. Way to go, girl. Thanks, but I'm still going to be sweeping up the museum and the hat shop for weeks until they and the Larry Mobile are all fixed up. But telling the truth was worth it, right? Definitely. If I'd kept going with the lies, who knows how many more places I'd have to sweep up. Larry Boy, is there anything you'd like to add now that you've redeemed yourself? Just remember, the truth is hard to beat. And everyone watching can be. <laughs> Today's devotional is God First. Our verse is Matthew 6, verse 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also.
Let's talk. What did we learn? What did the little fish want more than anything? What are some things that you value or treasure?
How do we live out what we've just learned? What does the Bible say we should store up and treasure? Loving God and learning about Him are ways we treasure God first before anything else. What are ways we can put God first as a family? Let's pray together. Let's ask God to help us remember to focus on Him and treasure Him first before anything else. Um, Marsha, what are you doing? I'm practicing impressions. You mean you can sound like other people? Cool. Who can you do? Well, you, Coco. Really? I'd love to hear it. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Coco, a blue mug with a delightful, hilarious, quick-witted marshmallow co-host. That's pretty good. Who else can you do? I can do the announcer. Listen. It's Coco Talk! Today's guest. Sammy the Slingshot to discuss the importance of accuracy. And our friend Fruitcake with a family recipe for shepherd's pie. Now our hosts, Coco and Marsha. Hello everyone. We are super excited for today's show. Sammy the Slingshot is here. Do you know who she reminds me of? David Slingshot. Like the David Slingshot? Yep, David the Shepherd who became David the King. His Slingshot. Oh, that's so old school. Not to mention Old Testament. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if the next guest on the show was the rock who flew out of the Slingshot and hit Goliath? We tried to book him. He's on tour with his rock band. So he's a rock star? Get it? David was another kind of rock star. He was outsized by Goliath and faced him with nothing but a slingshot, a stone, and faith that God would win. And he did. Wow. So it didn't matter that Goliath was bigger because God was on David's side. Nothing really matters because you have God on your side. Here's a reenactment. I wonder if slingshots ever get dizzy spinning round and round and round and round and round. Great question. Why don't we ask? <laughs> Out of time so soon? Well, Sammy, we have to swing back to you. And fruitcake, Marsha and I were really wanting to have that shepherd's pie for dinner. Wait, what are we having for dinner now? No idea. But we'll talk to you all next time on Coco Talk. Jesus, Messiah, Teacher, King. Jesus is the Messiah. This week's memory verse is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We're talking about a very famous prophet, a man named Isaiah. God used Isaiah to deliver messages from about 740 B.C. until around 680 B.C. In other words, from about 20 years before the Northern Kingdom was destroyed until about 40 years after. God had Isaiah warn Israel and Judah about the terrible things that were going to happen, about the end of Israel. But God also gave Isaiah another message, an amazing message. God told Isaiah what he was going to do next. He told him about the Messiah. The what? The Hebrew word Messiah means anointed one.
That's right. Isaiah announces a Messiah who's for everyone, not just Israel. For unto us a child is born. Brother Louie, we sang that already. What else does he say? Isaiah says this Messiah will be punished for our sins. All the punishment we deserve will be put on this Messiah instead of on us. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Isaiah 53, 5. Isaiah is saying, look ahead, look forward. It's all about the Messiah. Let's say the memory verse together. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Let's talk. What did we learn? Who was the Messiah that Isaiah was talking about? How do we live out what we've just learned? Who can we tell about Jesus? How would you tell someone that Jesus is the Messiah? Let's pray together. What do we want to thank God for today? What do we want to ask God for today? <laughs> Today's devotional is Don't Give Up. Verse is Galatians 6, verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Oh, oh. <laughs> <sighs> 
Let's talk. What did we learn? What was the elephant trying to do? Was it easy or hard for the elephant to help the flower? How do we live out what we've just learned? When have you felt like giving up because something was hard for you? What does today's verse encourage us to do? Let's pray together. Let's ask God to help us never grow weary of doing good things for Him and for others. If you can't handle the heat, get out of the cocoa. Now that's much better. <laughs> it's Coco Talk. Today's guest, Ivan the Ice Water with a message about living well. And our friend Fruitcake with tips for beating the heat. Now our hosts, Coco and Marsha. Welcome. Ivan the Ice Water is our super cool guest today. Right, Marsha? Marsha? Ah. Hey there, fellow uh, floaty. Not super talkative, is he? There's nothing as refreshing as ice water on a hot day. I love ice water, but it's nothing compared to sparkling water and definitely doesn't measure up to living water. You mean water that talks? No. Living water is what Jesus offered to the woman at the well. Did she drink it? Not exactly. You don't actually drink the kind of water Jesus offered her. He knew what the woman really needed was eternal life that comes when we have faith in him. Eternal? That's like forever. Exactly. Refreshing water forever sounds amazing. Before we dive in with Ivan, we have footage of some really big ice water in his homeland. Now that's a floaty. Let's find out more about how Ivan handles the heat. Aw, 
Oh man, we're out of time already? Thanks for chilling with us, Ivan. We should get you out of here before you melt. And fruitcake, we're sorry again. But you always keep it fresh. Talk to you all next time on Coco Talk. <laughs> 60 Second Bible Stories, Episode 1 Creation. Today's verse is Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let's wind the clock back, right to the beginning. There's no computers. No school. No parents. No cars. No animals and no trees. Nothing, just God, and he decides to get creative. Now, the earth was formless and dark. And on day one, God said, let there be light, and pop, it appeared. He then called the light day and the darkness night. Day two, God creates the sky. On day three, it starts to get really exciting. God creates land and then covers it with loads of grass, plants, trees and bushes. Day four, he adds the sun, moon and all the twinkly stars. And on five, he fills the sea with fish and the air with birds. Day six, he makes all the animals. Cows, sheep, rhinos, creepy crawlies, lizards, tigers, giraffes, monkeys. Yes, I think they get the idea. He also made something very special, us humans. On day seven, he puts his feet up and has a little rest. <sighs> a good job done. Let's talk. What did we learn? What did God create on the first day? What did God do on the seventh day? Let's pray together. Let's thank God for his gift of creation. What else would you like to thank God for today? Adam and Eve. Today's verse is Genesis 3.23. So the Lord God sent them out of the Garden of Eden, where they would have to work the ground from which the man had been made. So after God created the world, he made the first human. His name was Adam, and he lived in a beautiful garden made for him by God. In the garden, there were lots of trees. And God told Adam that he could eat the fruit from any tree except from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if he did, he would die. Adam does as he's told and things go well. God gives him the job of naming all the animals. Uh, rhinoceros? and then decides to make him a special friend. God put Adam into a deep sleep, took out one of his ribs, and made a woman. Her name was Eve. Things went swimmingly until a nasty serpent showed up. He tricked Eve into eating the forbidden fruit. And she gave some of the fruit to Adam. They then became rather aware they were naked, so made clothes out of fig leaves. When God came to speak with them, they hid. Yes, that's right. They tried to play hide and seek with God. He soon found them, and Adam mm. told him what happened. God cursed the serpent for his trickery and kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden. Let's talk. What did we learn? What did God tell Adam and Eve not to do? How do you think they felt when they left the garden? Let's pray together. What would you like to thank God for today? What would you like to ask God for today? Noah. Today's verse is Genesis 9, 12 to 13. The rainbow that I have put in the sky will be my sign to you and to every living creature on earth. It will remind you that I will keep this promise forever. Imagine if God asked you to build a boat. And not a small boat, a really big, massive boat. It'd be pretty mind-blowing. I mean, where would you start? Well, that's what happened to Noah. 
Back then, the world had become a pretty messed up place. God even regretted making man. So he decided to destroy everything with a great flood. But Noah found favour with God. And he told Noah to make a huge ark. A kind of cruise ship, but not so luxurious. Anyway, he did it. Noah then took his family onto the ark just as God commanded. God also sent pairs of every kind of animal, creepy crawly and bird onto the ark. Then the flood came. The waters rose so high they covered the tallest mountain. Everything died. But Noah, his family and the animals were safe in the ark. After months of floating about, the waters stopped rising and the ark landed on a mountain top. When the waters had gone, God gave the command and they all left the ark. He then promised to never flood the world again and put a rainbow in the sky as a sign of that promise. Let's talk. What did we learn? What did God ask Noah to do? What do you think it would have been like to be on a boat with all those animals? Let's pray together. What would you like to thank God for today? What would you like to ask God for today? Moses. Today's verse is Exodus 3.12. God replied, I will be with you, and you will know that I am the one who sent you when you worship me on this mountain, after you have led my people out of Egypt. God's people, the Israelites, were slaves to the Egyptians. But God had a plan to rescue them. He commanded a man called Moses, via a burning bush, like you do, to go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let God's people go. After a bit of convincing, he set off along with his brother Aaron. They asked Pharaoh, but he said no. Not really a surprise. So God began a series of plagues to convince Pharaoh to change his mind. First, he turned the water in the River Nile into blood. Then sent a plague of frogs. Followed by a plague of gnats, then a plague of flies, a plague to the Egyptian livestock, and a plague of boils, then the biggest hailstorm ever, followed by locusts and then darkness. But Pharaoh still said no. A tough cookie to crack. So then God killed the firstborn son of each family, except for those that had put the blood of a lamb over their doorway. Finally, Pharaoh let them go. So Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. God even divided the Red Sea so they could escape. God had saved his people. Let's talk. What did we learn? What did God ask Moses to do? How did God lead his people out of Egypt? Let's pray together. What would you like to thank God for today? What would you like to ask God for today? David and Goliath. Today's verse is 1 Samuel 17, 47. Everybody here will see that the Lord doesn't need swords or spears to save his people. The Lord always wins his battles and he will help us defeat you. David was a young shepherd boy who looked after his father's sheep. His three oldest brothers were away fighting the Philistines with King Saul. One day, his dad asked him to take his brother some food. When he got there, he found the armies lined up ready for battle. He then saw a huge man coming out from the Philistine ranks. His name was Goliath and he was their champion. He shouted out a challenge. He wanted a one-on-one, -on -one, winner-takes-all fight. But the Israelites just froze in fear, and no one would fight him. Well, except for David. David told King Saul that he would fight Goliath. But Saul said no, he was too young. David was used to defending his sheep against lions and bears. So Goliath didn't scare him. Saul gave David his armor, but it was a tad on the big side. So instead, he took his staff, sling, and some stones and went to face Goliath. As Goliath started to approach, him. David ran forward, put a stone in his sling and flung it at the giant. The stone hit him in the forehead and Goliath dropped down dead. God had given David a massive victory. Let's talk. What did we learn? Why was David at the battlefield? What happened when David fought Goliath? Let's 
Let's pray together. What would you like to thank God for today? What would you like to ask God for today? Daniel and the Lion's Den. Today's verse is Daniel 6, 27. God rescues and saves people and does mighty miracles in heaven and on earth. He is the one who saved Daniel from the power of the lions. Daniel was a servant of King Darius. The king liked him and decided to make him the leader of his whole kingdom. The other leaders weren't really a fan of this idea, so hatched a plan to get rid of Daniel. They went to the king and asked that he make a new law. One where no one was to pray to any god or man except to the king. If they did, they would be thrown into the lion's den. Ow! The king agreed and the law was passed. The leaders knew that Daniel wouldn't stop praying to God. And they soon caught him in the act and told the king. He was upset but couldn't go back on his word. The plan had worked. Daniel was arrested and thrown to the lions. The next day, the king went straight back, removed the stone lid and called out to Daniel. And Daniel replied. God had sent an angel to shut the lion's mouth. There wasn't a scratch on him. He was lifted out of the den. And Darius had all the men who had falsely accused Daniel thrown to the lions. Who gobbled them up. He then made it law that people should fear and revere Daniel's God. Let's talk. What did we learn? Why did the king have to punish Daniel? What happened to Daniel when he was in the lion's den? Let's pray together. What would you like to thank God for today? What would you like to ask God for today? Jonah! Today's verse is Jonah 2, 2. When I was in trouble, Lord, I prayed to you and you listened to me. I begged for your help and you answered my prayer. Nineveh had become a pretty wicked place. And not in the cool sense. One day, God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and tell them to stop being naughty. Jonah refused and ran away. He got on a boat and sailed for Tarshish. So God decided to use a bit of gentle encouragement and sent a huge storm. Which almost broke up the boat! The sailors were petrified and started lobbing the cargo off the boat. Meanwhile, Jonah was having a snooze below deck. The captain woke him up. And they all drew lots to see who was responsible for the calamity. Jonah got the short straw. Oh. And tells them to throw him overboard. The sailors didn't want to kill him. So they tried to row back to shore. But God cranked up the storm. So in the end, they had to do it. In he went and the storm stopped. God then sent a massive fish to swallow Jonah. While inside, Jonah prayed. God heard him and got the fish to spit him onto dry land. Jonah went to Nineveh, told the people to repent, and they obeyed God. Let's talk. What did we learn? What happened when God asked Jonah to go to Nineveh? Why did God make the big fish spit Jonah out? Let's pray together. What would you like to thank God for today? What would you like to ask God for today? Marsha, what are you doing? Spring cleaning. Where'd you even get this stuff? Oh, here and there. I've never seen you wear any of it. Well, for some reason, floating around in hot cocoa all day, I never get cold. <laughs> It's Coco Talk! Today's guest, Stone, the Super Slam Rockwell, with a message about miracles. And our friend Fruitcake with exercise tips. Now our hosts, Coco and Marsha! Happy Easter, everyone! Before we get to our hard-hitting interview, Stone the Super Slam Rockwell has challenged me to see if I can roll him over. Ooh, what do you get if you move him? I get to pick the music for the end of the show. But if I can't roll him over, then he chooses one of your songs? 
Do you really have your own music? Oh yeah, rock and roll. Amazing. Okay, let's do this. Are you ready to roll, Fruitcake? Okay, in three, two, one. Well, that does look like a challenge. It is. I could use a miracle right about now. Oh, oh, do you know what you remind me of, Mr. Stone from the Super Slam? C can I call you just Stone? You remind me of the big stone they put in front of Jesus' tomb when they buried him after he died on the cross. It was really hard to move, too. But when Jesus' friends went to see him, the stone was rolled away. <gasps> How did they move it? Asking for a friend. They didn't move it. And if you think that's amazing, get this. Jesus wasn't there. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. oh, that's right. The Bible says Jesus' friends found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they looked inside, they didn't find him there. Yep, Jesus had risen. That was the biggest miracle. He was alive again and is still alive today. That is amazing. You think you're amazed? After Jesus' friends left, they saw him walking along the road. They were so surprised. Jesus had risen. He had risen indeed. Are you okay? Maybe we should roll to a clip. Oh, right. Rolling! Whoa, you're really rolling. That's rock and roll if I ever saw it. Looks like we'll be hearing that Marsha song after all, Mr. Stone. Tell us, what's the secret for getting you to roll? Oh, man, we're out of time. Thanks for being here, Stone the Super Slam. And Fruitcake, appreciate you reffing. We really wanted to hear about your exercise routine. See you all next time on Coco Talk. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What happened to my song? Credit, rubble, towards mine and stone. Rubble, pebbles, tubs, and soapstone. The fruit of the Spirit. When you have the Holy Spirit, you will produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love. Here are some things that I love. Pencils. Sharp pencils. Red pens. Blue pens. The scientific explanation for love is quite complicated, but fascinating. When you mix together equal parts of adrenaline, dopamine, and serotonin... No, 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 love! It's all about feeling. Flowers and chocolate. It's spaghetti for two by candlelight. It's dancing in the rain. It's sunshine and rainbows. Huh? Let's just see what the Bible has to say about love. Love is patient and kind. It does not want what belongs to others. It does not brag. It is not proud or rude. It does not look out for its own interests, easily become angry, or keep track of other people's wrongs. Love is not happy with evil, but is full of joy when the truth is spoken. It always protects, trusts, hopes, and never gives up. Love never fails. And that's the kind of love that Jesus shows us every day. Let's talk. What did we learn? What do you think of when you hear the word love? What are some of the ways the Bible describes love? How can we live out what we've just learned? God gives us the fruit of the Spirit, including love. What are some ways that we can show that love to our family and friends this week? Let's pray together. Let's thank God that He loves us so much. Let's ask Him to fill our hearts with love for the people we meet this week.
Time management, Venetian blinds, plaid, not that fancy argyle. Who made the sun, who made the moon, who made the aardvark and the boo, who made the species human and then dropped us here on earth, who made the whales and polar bears, who knows our names and numbers, hey? who never sleeps and always cares and tells us what we're worth, do you know what's in the Bible, is it true, is it reliable, absolutely verifiable, let's all take a look, in the Bible, did he say Bible? Book Denver. So the Bible is a book. It's got pages and words just like other books. But if you open it up, you realize it's actually lots of books. 66 to be exact. There are books of history, books of poetry, books that are really letters written to different people or churches. Are there any books about ponies? Um, no. But there's even a book that talks about the end of the world. But we'll save that one until the end. It's a little tricky. Wow. So the Bible is sort of like other books and sort of isn't. That's right. Most books are written by just one person. The Bible was written by more than 40. Most books are written in, oh, six months or a year. We think the Bible may have been written over as much as 1,600 years. 1,600 years! That's like writing a book from the end of the Roman Empire until today. Done. That's incredible! And now, uh, through the magic of a popsicle stick of puppetry, we bring you the story of everything. Everything? Pretty much. God, the man, the world. It's a genesis, man. It's the beginning of everything. Okay, let's hear it. A long time ago, right about uh, here, uh, there was God. God is a cloud? It makes about as much sense as showing him as an old man with whiskers. I see your point. The Bible says God is love, but when we tried to show him as a heart, he just looked like a valentine. Mm, too hallmark. Right. He appeared to the Israelites as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. The fire thing was a little scary. So we decided to go with the cloud. I think we made the right choice. I couldn't agree more. In the beginning, there was nothing but God. No planets, no stars, no trees, no iguanas, no toaster ovens, no kids, no eyeglasses. Chester! Nothing, just God. And then he created, he spoke, and the universe came into being. The earth was formed and cooled and water appeared. Then God caused the plants and the fish and animals to pop up. And then he said, watch what I'm going to do next. This is going to be great. And boom, he made a man and a woman. They didn't have any clothes, so they had to stand behind the bushes whenever anyone took their picture. What? You know, for kids' Bibles and stuff. So God put Adam and Eve in a wonderful garden with everything they could want, and he gave them this uh, free will. That's right. But to really have free will, they needed to have a choice to make. So he put a tree in the garden and said that if they loved him and trusted him, they shouldn't eat from that tree. God gave Adam and Eve a choice. Trust him or trust the voices they heard around him. They chose poorly. By turning away from God, they said they didn't believe him. They were going to go their own way. And sin entered the world. What sin? Sin is when we ignore God, when we go our own way, when we put ourselves first in front of our friends and neighbors and in front of God. When we say to God, I don't care what you say, I'm going to do it my way. Sin entering the world changed everything. Why? Because of who God is. God is so pure, sin cannot be near him. Now that serpent knew that. He was trying to hurt God, and he knew if he could get Adam and Eve to sin, then they couldn't be close to God. God's most beloved creatures would have to live their lives apart from him. Couldn't God just change the rules so they could be with him again? He can do anything, right? Yes, God can do anything. Anything except change his own nature. 
He can't change who he is. If God changed who he was, he wouldn't be God anymore. So even though it made God very, very sad, Adam and Eve had to leave the garden and live new lives in a wild, mean world. Now they're a long, long way from paradise. Yes, they're a long, long way from home. And now the world they're in ain't very nice because they're living on their own. So once again, we ask the question, who do you trust? Who do you listen to? How are you going to live your life? This is choice. We've got to wrestle through every girl and boy and man and wife. This isn't a very happy story. Nope. And unfortunately, the rest of primeval history only gets worse. Sin has a way of spreading. So much so that one of Adam and Eve's sons turned on his brother and killed him. Oh, no. Then there were more and more people and more and more sin until God's creation was drowning in sin. God decided the only way to keep his creation from drowning in sin was to drown the sin. So he flooded the whole world. Oh, I know this story. Yep, all that sin was washed away. Unfortunately, so was most of his creation. But he chose one family led by one man to start over. Noah. That's right. Noah had tried to avoid sin all his life so he could be closer to God. He wasn't perfect, but he was a good man who listened for God's voice. That's why God chose him to start things over. Even a bunch of animals, of course. Who came in by twosies? Except for the ones they used for food. They came in by sevenies. You see, Noah trusted God and listened to God, and God used his family to start over again to give his creation a second chance. So patriarchal history is the story of God working through a series of fathers to save the world. Let's take a look. It's about 2000 BC, or 2000 years before Jesus was born, and we're in the city of Ur, possibly the biggest city in the world at that time, which was in what is now southern Iraq. Have you heard of Iraq? Yes, it's been in the news. Anyway, that's where Abram lived. Abram? Who's he? He's our first patriarch. There he was, minding his own business when God launched his rescue plan by tapping Abram on the shoulder. Abram heard a voice say, leave your father's house and go to the land I will show you. Abram figured this voice was God and thought he better listen to him. So he and his wife Sarah left Ur and wandered off following God's voice. And so God's plan began. That's how it starts. Two people wandering away from town. Yep, an act of faith. That's always how God's plans start. Someone hears God's voice, they believe, and they follow. And God uses them to do amazing things. Hallelujah, look what God can do. Hallelujah, his promises come true. If God is who he says he is, then we can trust his promises, so hallelujah, look what God can do. By faith, Abraham left his home in Ur. What's faith? Faith is believing that God is who he says he is, and that he'll do what he says he'll do. God said Abraham would have a son even though his wife couldn't have kids, and he was crazy old. And Abraham believed God. He had faith. And God gave him a son. Now, our faith grows the most when it's tested. So God asked Abraham if he would give up his son. Give up his son? Why would God want him to do that? God didn't want Abraham to give up Isaac. He wanted him to be willing to give up Isaac. God wanted to know if Abraham trusted him more than anything. Wanted to know if he would let go of everything before he'd let go of God. So what happened? Did Isaac have to die? I don't like this story. Hold on. At the last minute, as Abraham was ready to sacrifice Isaac to give him up to God, God sent an angel to stop him. And then he provided a ram for the sacrifice to take Isaac's place. Now God knew that Abraham trusted him completely. And Abraham and Isaac's faith grew because they knew God would keep his promises always. And they cried out, Hallelujah, look what God can do. Hallelujah, His promises come true. The evidence in miracles says God can work a miracle, so hallelujah. 
Now Isaac lived by faith, just as his father had before him. He got married and had a son named Jacob. Jacob trusted God too, and God gave him a whole mess of sons. His favorite was Joseph. Oh, I know about Joseph. He's the one with a fancy coat. Right. His brothers didn't like it, though. They thought it was too flashy. Well, actually, his brothers were jealous that their father loved Joseph the most. So they decided to get rid of Joseph once and for all by selling him. What? They sold their brother? Who heard of such a thing? Actually, I tried to sell you once when you were little. What? It was just in the neighbors. I got your back. You sold me? You were bagging me. Let's not tell Mum about it, all right? You sold me? Ahem. Anywho, Joseph ended up in jail in Egypt, even though he hadn't done anything wrong. But God remembered his promises to Abraham, and he used Joseph to save Egypt from a famine. That means no food. And he became the right-hand man to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Joseph was the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. That's amazing. God even used him to save his brothers and the rest of his family from the famine and bring them to live with him in Egypt. And his brothers were so amazed, all they could say was, Hallelujah, the group got to do. Hallelujah, his promises come true. Things are bad, we have no food, but Joseph is a righteous dude. Hallelujah, the group got to do. And that's the end of patriarchal history and the end of the book of Genesis. Abraham and his kids trusted God. They lived by faith and God used them to change the world. It seems like that rescue plan is a little bit stuck. Yes, for almost 400 years, the children of Israel, that's what we call them because Israel was the new name God gave Jacob, the children of Israel seemed stuck in Egypt. Abraham's descendants were certainly multiplying, but they weren't getting their own land and they were slaves. But God was about to get his rescue plan back in gear as it's time to meet one of the most important people in the Bible and in all of history, a guy named Moses. Have you heard of him? This is a story about a boy. His name was Moses and it brought his mom such joy. She had to hide him. It makes me shiver to keep old Pharaoh's men from throwing him in the river. A Hebrew baby was born and hidden in a reed basket at the edge of the Nile River. And who should find him but Pharaoh's own daughter, who adopted him and named him Moses. He was raised in the royal palace, but still knew he was a Hebrew, a child of Israel. And one day, when he saw an Egyptian beating another Hebrew, he got so mad, he sort of overreacted. Did he call him a name? Um, no. He, uh, he killed him. He what? Um... Yep, he killed the Egyptian. Well, that couldn't have gone over very well. No, it didn't. When Pharaoh found out, he said Moses had to die, and so Moses did what most sensible people would do. What's that? He took off running! And now he's running, running, running for his life Out to the desert where he finds himself a wife Her name's Zipporah. And now he's hiding out with his sheep Cause he knows back in Egypt he's in trouble deep now, you probably know this story. So Moses is in the desert when God shows up in a bush. Wait, God is in a bush? Well, he's speaking through a bush. Not an ordinary bush, though. It's burning. That makes it more dramatic. Right. I can see why that would make it more dramatic. Right. More dramatic than a regular bush. But what if the bush was a dancing bush or a juggling bush? That'd be dramatic, wouldn't it? Let's stay focused. Sorry. Ahem. So God tells Moses to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let his people go. And Moses says, I don't want to. And God says, I want you to. And Moses says, I can't. And God says, you can. And Moses says, will you come with me? And God says, of course I will. And so Moses goes back to Egypt to face down Pharaoh. This is a story about a man who faced a stubborn king that didn't understand that when you park your stubborn self right in God's way, 
Let's just assume you're gonna have a lousy day. Oh, there were gnats and frogs and the river turned to blood and there were flies and boils and the cows fell with the thud and then the locusts came and ate up all the crops and there was hail and darkness but he wouldn't stop saying no. That's right, Pharaoh still wouldn't let them go, so God had to do something very serious. The final plague was the death of Egypt's firstborn sons. It was terribly sad, but it finally convinced Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go. To protect their own sons from the final plague, God told the Israelites to sacrifice a spotless lamb, a lamb without flaw, and put the blood on the doorposts of their homes. The angel that brought death to the Egyptian sons saw the blood on the doorposts and passed over the Israelite homes. Jewish people celebrate this miraculous part of God's rescue plan each year with a festival called Passover. Wait a minute. What was so special about that lamb that it could save the life of a boy? There was nothing special about the lamb. It was just a regular lamb. But God used a spotless lamb as a lesson about sin and a sign of something that would happen much later in his rescue plan. So what was the lesson? He was reminding them that the price of sin is death. Death was coming to the Egyptians at night because of their sin. But the Israelites weren't perfect either. In 400 years in Egypt, most of them had forgotten all about God. They were doing whatever they wanted to do. So the lamb at Passover was a reminder that sin takes our life away. Rather than losing their sons, God let them use lambs as a sacrifice for their own sin to take the place of their sons. That sort of reminds me of Abraham and Isaac. What do you mean? Well, God provided that ram to take the place of Isaac. Isaac didn't have to die. Instead, the ram took his place on the altar. Oh, it's connected. Yep, God does that a lot. The ram instead of Isaac and the lamb instead of the sons of Israel are both signs God used to point ahead to his ultimate rescue plan. His ultimate plan for saving us from the power and the price of sin. Ooh, tell me that part. I can't. It's in the New Testament and we're not there yet. Rats. The Egyptians learned the hard way that sinning against God can lead to death. And now the Israelites were learning that this was true for them, too. Trying to live so close to a holy God was very, very hard. So did they give up? Some of them wanted to. Some even wanted to go back to Egypt and be slaves again. But by the end of the 40-year timeout and Moses' big pep talk, the children of Israel were excited to be God's holy nation again and were ready to follow their new leader, Joshua, into the Promised Land. And that brings us to the end of the first big section of the Bible, the Pentateuch. It's not a fluke that it all starts out with the Pentateuch. Five little books that tell the story of God. And Adam and Eve and Joseph and... Sometimes called five books of Moses. He's the one whose life composes. The storyline of all these books with the exception of Genesis. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Read a little every day before you slumber. Cap it all off with a trip through Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. Parts are fun, others not so much. With sinning and flooding and plagues and such. Whether you're German or French or Dutch. We can all learn a thing from the pen of touch. That's not right. Whether you're a king or a queen or a duke. We, we can, can all learn, learn a thing, thing from the pen of touch. Genesis is the introduction. Tell us why the world has ceased to function. Quite the way God intended it from the start. From the start, from the very beginning. Sin came in and made a mess up. All the God was gonna bless us Because we did not trust him with all our hearts And now we've fallen The world is fallen Oh yes, we've fallen Away from God It's a tragedy, nasty tragedy And now we're broken Our hearts are broken And our whole world is seriously flawed It's all messed up But God's gonna launch his rescue plan That starts with Sarah and Egypt, they get stuck. Slave.
waves to Pharaoh out of luck. So God told Moses he'd help out, and that's what he did. You bet your pee We see in Exodus they have success because Moses respects our God and his decree. That's a fancy word for law. And now it's I and I, the laws get piled up high. Leviticus is a bunch of rules. The numbers the Israelites act like fools. Forty years later, Moses schooled them again. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. We'll try harder, the young one said. Moses gets older, now he's dead. He follow Joshua instead, all the way to the promised land. We like the Bible, it's not a fluke that it all starts out with the Pentateuch. Joseph and Whether you're a king or a queen or a duke We can all learn a thing from the Pentateuch Before we get to Matthew, Mark and Luke We really need to understand the Pentateuch The historical books are the next 12 books Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther What's next, Sunday School reading? That brings us to the 8th book of the Bible Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. Ruth is a tiny little book that's easy to read. It tells just one story, the story of a woman named Gladys. I'm kidding. Her name is Ruth. Once upon a time, there was a woman named Ruth. She wasn't an Israelite. She was from Moab, a country Israel didn't like very much. But Ruth, she married an Israelite. As our story begins, Ruth, her Israelite husband, and her husband's mother were all living in the Moab because there was a famine in Israel. So there they are in the Moab when, oh no, Ruth's husband dies. I don't know what happened. Maybe he got hit by a bus. I don't think they had buses back then. Okay, maybe he got to hit by a cow. Chester. A goat? Chester. An ill-tempered iguana? Chester. Now, Ruth's mother-in-law, her name is Naomi. She doesn't have a husband either. He died a while back. Probably another iguana. Chester. Or something. Naomi doesn't really belong in the Moab. She's an Israelite. So as soon as the famine ends, she decides to go back to Israel. Of course, she is old and has no husband and no money. So she'll have to beg for food. Her life will be sad. Well, guess what? Ruth doesn't want that to happen. She loves Naomi. So even though Moab is her home, Ruth says to Naomi, I will come with you. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful? I'm telling you, that part makes me cry every time. Yeah, that's really something. Uh, anyway, this amazing Ruth, she leaves her home and goes to Israel with Naomi to take care of her. Every day she follows the workers in the fields to pick up little bits of grain to, to share with Naomi. Oh, I'm losing it, but... But get this, this is the best part. So she's picking up bits of grain in a field that belongs to a wealthy man named Boaz, who happens to be related to Naomi's old husband, the one that died in the iguana accident. I don't think he was killed by an iguana. Whatever. Anyway, Boaz sees Ruth in the field and hears about what she's done for Naomi. He hears about her great love for her mother-in-law. And get this, he falls in love love with Ruth. Wonderful Ruth. And, and Ruth and Boaz end up getting married. And Boaz takes care of Ruth and takes care of Naomi, her mother-in-law. And everyone is happy. Oh, gather round kids and hear me sing. All about Israel's godly king. See what good this guy can bring in the books of First and Second Samuel. Israel is a nasty mess. Just three judges and get depressed. A king could help them pass the test in the books of First and Second Samuel. That's the books of First and Second Samuel. 
Samuel was a prophet, and a very important prophet, because God used him to find and help Israel's king. So God sent Samuel out one more time to pick a king, a godly king who would follow God's heart rather than his own. And this time, God had him pick... David! Right? Am I right, or is it someone else? David. David was a son of a man named Jesse, who was a son of Obed, who was a son of Ruth and Boaz. David was a godly young man from a godly family. Samuel anointed David with oil. That was a sign that God was choosing him. As soon as Samuel anointed David, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Tell him about the promise. What promise? You mean the one about the land and the nation and the blessing for the world? The one God gave Abraham? Oh no, it's a new promise for David. That's right, Brother Louis. God is so pleased with David that in chapter 7 of 2 Samuel, he makes David an amazing promise. God tells David that someone from his family, one of his descendants, will rule over God's people forever. Whoa, that's a big promise. It sure is. This promise is called the Davidic Covenant. Davidic? What kind of word is Davidic? The word Davidic means about David, or having to do with David. Oh, so if something was about Ian, it would be Ianic. Well... And if it was about Clive, it would be Cloivic. <laughs> Cloivic, that's funny. Hilarious. This promise for David, or Davidic covenant, is so important that in the New Testament, when Matthew talks about God's rescue plan, he puts King David right in the middle. So God's ultimate rescue plan, the blessing for the whole world, is going to come from David's family. Hey, shouldn't we sum up everything we learned with a song? That's a great idea. Let's sing it in the river, in our canoes. If you open the Old Testament and read it categorically, you'll find a dozen books that we are meant to read historically. They tell the tales of Israel, there's nothing metaphorical, and that is why these books are in the section called historical. Oh, hello, Clive and Ian. Hi there. Hello. Oh, Joshua and Judges and Ruth and both the Samuels. First and second kings in front of first and second chronicles. Ezra, Nehemiah, and now there's just one more to fall. Esther is the final of the books we call historical. And what do we learn from these books? Anyone? The dad will keep his promises always and forevermore. And he is always with us, no matter what may be in store. But from these books, the lesson learned that peace with God cannot be earned from Joshua to Nehemiah. What they need is a Messiah. So we're wrapping up our journey through the books we call historical. We'll ask another question, and no, it's not rhetorical. Do you think that you are good enough fall on your own to get to God? Or have you learned from Israel that humankind is badly flawed? They tried a thousand years but couldn't right their wrong behavior. And that is why for you and I the answer is a savior. Yes, yes that, that is why for you and I the answer is a savior. That's just what we need. <laughs> and maybe a paddle. The Old Testament is filled with poetry. Nearly every book has at least a little poetry, but right in the middle, we hit five books that are almost all poetry. We call these books the writings. Job is an interesting book about a guy who loses everything and has to take a look to see if he only trusted God because his life was grand could he still be trusting if all he had was sand and sores all over his body yes that too Psalms is 150 songs 
You could try to sing a all, but it would take too long. They'd write a song when they were glad or when they'd been invaded. And nearly half of all the songs were written by King David. He must have been very busy. Indeed. And then along comes Proverbs. A book that's full of proverbs. Short little sayings that make us wise. And teach us how to live our lives. What's cool is that a lot of them were written by King Solomon. That almost rhymed. It was close. What's next? Ecclesiastes, 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 Ecclesiastes. If life seems meaningless and hard to understand, listen to the preacher and he'll give you a hand. Because there's no need for questioning your sanity. No vanity of vanity, everything is vanity. When you're thinking, you're thinking in the sand. Trust God and follow his commands. Now one more book in the writings. Though I don't find it particularly exciting. Song of Solomon. Mushy, mushy, mushy. Celebrating love between a man and a woman Engaged to be married Saying silly things like My dear, you've got goats in your hair He doesn't seem very wise Perhaps you'll like it when you're older No, I don't think so And those are the writings Job and Psalms and Proverbs Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon Hairy sheep teeth The end The next section of the Old Testament is called the Prophets and some of the books are very, very short. Pastor Paul, what is a prophet? Several Hebrew words are translated as prophet in English. The most common means one who is called. Most importantly, a prophet is someone who speaks for someone else. In the Old Testament, that someone else is usually God. So in the Old Testament, a prophet is someone who is called by God to speak for him. The major prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And the minor prophets are all the others, except Lamentations, which tags along with Jeremiah in the major prophets. So the prophets did what exactly? Prophets were kind of like alarm clocks. Beg pardon? An alarm clock is a wake-up call. If you're about to miss something important because you're asleep, like school or church or your wedding, an alarm clock goes off and wakes you up. It yells, hey, stop sleeping or there's going to be trouble. Most people I know don't particularly like alarm clocks. I don't like my alarm clock at all. Sometimes people really don't want to be woken up. And the same was true of prophets. When Israel wasn't following the covenant, when they'd sort of fallen asleep in their relationship with God, God would send a prophet like an alarm clock to sound an alarm, to say, hey, wake up or there's gonna be trouble. And just like with alarm clocks, it didn't always go so well. The first book of the prophets is a book of Isaiah. Isaiah is a really long book with 66 chapters. The book of Isaiah is so long partly because Isaiah's ministry as a prophet was so long. The name Isaiah means Yahweh is salvation. So what's important about Isaiah? What do we need to remember? That God is holy and will judge sin but also that God is the one who can save us. Yahweh is our salvation. King Hezekiah got it right. King Ahaz didn't. That's right. Most importantly, Isaiah tells us that God can save all of us through the Messiah. Isaiah announces a Messiah who's for everyone, not just Israel. What else does he say? Isaiah says this Messiah will be punished for our sins. All the punishment we deserve will be put on this Messiah instead of on us. 
But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Isaiah 53, 5. Isaiah is saying, look ahead, look forward. It's all about the Messiah. What a great message. What a great book. But we gotta keep moving. We need to sing a song to summarize all of them. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and then Lamentations. Ezekiel, Daniel, without hesitation comes Hosea, Joel, and Amos, then Obadiah, Jonah, Mike, and Nam, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, then just three more tiny little guys, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Praise all the prophets, they're raining on fire. They're in two sections called the major and the minor. They bring God's messages. Judgment, instruction, aftermath, bright, bright future if you're walking on a godly path. Me and Dolls Prophet could wear you out quick from sleeping with the lions to staring at a brick. Reading about the prophets, prophesying to the government, teaches us important stuff about the new covenant. And how the Messiah is going to pay for our crime. Let's go through the list one more. Time. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and then Lamentations. Ezekiel, Daniel, without hesitation, comes Hosea, Joel, and Amos. Then Obadiah, Jonah, Mike, and Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah. Then just three more tiny little guys, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. They're in two sections called the major and the minor. And that's a quick overview of the Old Testament. God promised Abraham that he would make him a nation and that if they followed God's rules, his laws for how they should live, that God would bless them and live with them. Of course, they couldn't follow God's rules perfectly. They kept messing up over and over again. So Isaiah and the other prophets hint that a new solution is coming, a new covenant. And that brings us to the New Testament. Are you ready? This is where it gets good. So, where do we start? Revelation? Uh, no, that's the end of the New Testament. The epistles? No, we need to start at the beginning. The Gospels. Alrighty, the Gospels. Um, what is a Gospel? Good question. You've probably heard the word Gospel before. But what does it mean? Uh, Pastor Paul? The word gospel comes from the Old English word Godspell, which means God's good story. This Old English word came from the Greek word euangelion, meaning good news. So gospel means good news. And don't tell me this good news. It's the news about God's blessing for the world, the one we've been waiting for, the Messiah. But... In church, I learned that the New Testament is about Jesus. So what does Jesus have to do with the blessing for the whole world, the promise God made to Abraham? Good question, Ian. If you've spent much time in church, you probably know that the Gospels tell the story of Jesus. But how could the life of one man be God's blessing for the entire world? What did he do, and what does it matter to us? What is the good news? Then without further delay, the story of Jesus. I'm sure you all have heard the story of Jesus being born. Every Christmas, a manger, an inn, the star, the wise men. Right. The story of Jesus' birth is told in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Mark and John skip that part and start when Jesus has already grown up. But even Matthew and Luke don't start with the birth of Jesus. Luke starts with the birth of a guy named John. And Matthew starts with Jesus' genealogy. Do you know what a genealogy is? A genealogy is a record of a person's ancestry. Parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and so on and so on. Matthew traces Jesus' genealogy all the way back to Abraham. And right there in the middle, halfway between Abraham and Jesus, is King David. So Jesus is related to King David. So what? Wait, the Davidic Covenant. <gasps> oh, right, the promise God made to David that one of his descendants would rule God's people forever. Exactly. 
Matthew starts with Jesus' genealogy so that everyone who knows the Old Testament would say, hey, Jesus is a descendant of King David. You know what that might mean. It meant God's promise to David could be coming true in Jesus. Exactly. Right from the start, Matthew connects the New Testament to the Old Testament and says the promises God made to Abraham and Moses and the Israelites are coming true today. Well, what happened between him being born and being all grown up? We don't really know. Luke tells one story about Jesus when he was 12, but Mark and John don't even start until Jesus is already 30. For them, this is when the story of Jesus begins, and it begins with John the Baptist announcing that everything God has promised is about to come true. So Jesus shows up and asks John to baptize him too. And as Jesus comes up out of the water, the sky opens and the Spirit of God comes down on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven says, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Whoa, so that voice was God talking. Which means Jesus is God's son, the son of God. And the spirit that came down is the spirit of God. Wait, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? That's the Trinity, we learned about this. We sure did. God is one God with three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three are God, and yet God is one. I remember this part. It made my head hurt then, and it still makes my head hurt. The important thing is that now all three persons of God show up at one time in one place. Whoa, the people watching must have known something big was going on. Something very big was going on. So, what happened next? After his baptism and temptation in the wilderness, Mark tells us that Jesus went back to Galilee, the place he grew up, saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. Gospel, that means good news. Now Jesus picks 12 men to be his disciples. Uh, Pastor Paul, what is a disciple? A disciple is a follower of a teacher. At the time of Jesus, many rabbis, teachers of God's law, had disciples who followed them everywhere, learning everything they taught. John the Baptist had disciples of his own, some of whom started following Jesus. So Jesus picks 12 men to be his disciples. These guys are really important, and some, like Peter and John, end up writing books that are now in the New Testament. Jesus is teaching in Galilee, and people are amazed at what they hear. Why were they amazed? Was he really good at math? No, it wasn't that kind of teaching. Jesus was explaining the Old Testament scriptures, what the prophets meant when they said certain things. There were lots of teachers back then, but Jesus taught with authority, explaining things in ways no one had ever heard before, explaining things like he was God. But then Jesus started doing something even more amazing. He started healing people, people who were sick or blind, people who couldn't walk or who couldn't use one of their hands. Jesus just touched them or even just said a word and they were healed, completely healed. That must have gotten people's attention. It sure did. Suddenly Jesus was surrounded by huge crowds. Everyone wanted to be close to him. Jesus' teaching and miracles were attracting a lot of attention, including the Pharisees, who wanted to know who this new guy was and if he was following all their rules. So while the Pharisees and Sadducees try to figure out what to do, Jesus keeps traveling and teaching and healing people. He tells little stories called parables that teach about the kingdom of God. He explains how we should live in this kingdom. He calms a storm on the Sea of Galilee, showing he has authority over nature. He feeds 5,000 people with just a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish, showing he has authority to create abundance out of little. And he even brings a girl back from the dead, showing he has authority even over death. Now Passover was coming around again, so they all headed to Jerusalem. So Jesus and his disciples gather for the Passover meal, just like all the Jews did every year. But Jesus does something very different that no one expects. First, he says one of his 12 disciples is going to betray him, help the Sadducees and Pharisees grab him and take him away. This freaks everybody out. 
then Jesus picks up a piece of the bread they were eating and says, This is my body, which is given for you. Then he picks up the cup they were drinking from and says, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Wait, what's going on? Was Jesus saying that that he was the Passover lamb? He was the one who would die so that we could live? That's exactly what he was saying. Jesus took the Passover meal, where Israelites celebrated being saved from death and from slavery by the blood of a lamb, and said he was that lamb, that his blood could take away sin and death from everyone, the blessing for the whole world, the new covenant God was making with his children. (gasps) New covenant? That's what New Testament means. This is what the whole New Testament is about. The blood of Jesus is the new covenant. The whole Bible points to this moment from Genesis when we learn how creation was broken by sin, to Abraham, Moses, and David, to the prophets who say the answer is coming, the Savior is coming, the Messiah is coming. The entire Bible is about this. But the story isn't over yet. Jesus goes to a garden to pray. He knows what he has to do now, and it isn't going to be easy. After he prays, he turns to his friends and says, The hour has come. And right then, his disciple Judas shows up, leading a crowd of guards to arrest Jesus. They put Jesus on trial, first at the Jewish court called the Sanhedrin, run by the Sadducees and Pharisees. His crime? Blasphemy saying he was equal to God. His punishment? Death. But the Romans don't let the Sanhedrin put anyone to death themselves, so the members of the court drag Jesus to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And even though Pilate doesn't think Jesus has done anything wrong, he doesn't want the Sadducees and Pharisees to complain about him to Rome like they've done with other governors before him. So he gives in. He washes his hands in front of everyone, a way of saying, this isn't my fault. And he has Jesus killed, crucified, by nailing him to a wooden cross. The people around Jesus just saw a man dying on a cross, but that's not what God saw. God saw something very different happening. God saw his son, the son of God, on a cross. Then he saw the stain of our sin appearing on Jesus. Your sin, my sin, everything selfish and mean we've ever done or ever could do. The stain of all that sin was appearing on Jesus, even though he'd never done anything wrong at all. God saw his son stained with all the sin of the world. He saw him buried under all that sin. He saw him die under all that sin. And since the punishment for all that sin is death, death away from God, that's how Jesus died, alone, away from God. The last thing Jesus said was, God, God, why have you left me alone? That makes my heart break. It makes me wanna cry. So, Jesus took the punishment for my sin. He took the punishment that I deserved. He died alone so I wouldn't have to. I gotta think about that for a minute. But if he died, how can we say Jesus has power over death? Because he didn't stay dead. Jesus was crucified on a Friday and placed in a tomb that night. On Sunday morning, two women who were followers of Jesus went to the tomb and discovered something incredible. It was empty. The huge stone that blocked the entrance had been rolled away and Jesus wasn't there. Matthew and Luke both tell us that the women meet an angel who says Jesus is no longer dead. He's alive. This is what we celebrate on Easter Sunday. This is what we celebrate every Sunday, but especially on Easter Sunday. They didn't have to take the angel's word for it though, because Jesus appears right in front of them, living, 
walking around and talking. And then Jesus appears to his disciples, and then to more than 500 people. Jesus proved that he had authority over death itself, that the power of sin and death was broken, that the kingdom of God was real, and that we can all be a part of it. Wow, that's not just good news, that's amazing news. So is this it? Is that how it ends? Jesus tells his disciples to go tell everyone. Spread the blessing to the whole world so everyone can hear. So everyone has a chance to be a part of the new kingdom. And then, according to Luke, Jesus blesses his disciples and disappears into the clouds. Around 30 years after Jesus left his followers on earth, Luke sat down to write the history of everything that had happened from Jesus' birth up till that very day. He wrote his history in two parts. The first part told the story of Jesus, and the second part told what happened in the 30 years after Jesus left. His followers were called apostles, a word that means sent ones. Jesus sent them into the world to spread his message. Right. That's why the full name of Luke's second book is the Acts of the Apostles, but we call it Acts for short. Luke starts the book of Acts with the same scene that ended his gospel, Jesus saying goodbye to his disciples. But he tells them something interesting. He says they should stay in Jerusalem and wait for a gift that God the Father is going to give them, a gift that will help them spread the good news about Jesus throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It was 10 days after Jesus left them, 50 days after Passover, on a day called Pentecost. So all of Jesus' followers were together, kind of hiding away to try to keep out of trouble. And suddenly, a sound like a huge wind filled the house. And then something that looked like little tongues of fire came down on each one of them. Did they catch on fire? Did they stop, drop, and roll? Luke says it was like fire, not that it was fire. So no, they didn't catch on fire. Writing some parts of the Bible was tricky because the authors were trying to describe things that no one had ever seen before. So when Mark says the Spirit came down on Jesus like a dove, or when Luke says the Spirit came down on Jesus' followers like tongues of fire, it wasn't a real dove and their heads weren't really on fire. That's just the best way the authors could come up with to describe what people saw. So what powers did they get? Did anyone start shooting web? No, no web shooting. The first thing that happened was they all started speaking in different languages. The Holy Spirit gave Peter the power to get up and speak an amazing message about who Jesus was. Peter proclaimed the good news, and about 3,000 people who heard Peter speak became followers of Jesus that day. That power really helped them a lot. The apostles were preaching in the temple almost every day. So the Sadducees had them all arrested and thrown in jail. But that night, an angel came and let them out and then told them to go right back to preaching in the temple. So sure enough, the next morning when the Sadducees walked in, there were all the apostles out of jail and preaching in the temple. <laughs> I'd love to see the looks on their faces. They were amazed and furious. And so they had the temple guards beat the apostles with whips as a punishment and then let them go. The apostles who were beaten actually thanked God that they got to suffer for the name of Jesus. These are the same people who, when Jesus was arrested, ran away and hid. When Jesus was on trial, Peter told people three different times that he didn't even know Jesus. And now he's fearless. He's talking about Jesus no matter what happens. He's like a whole different person. That's what the Holy Spirit can do. Whoa. I sure wish I could be that brave. You can. This is the best news of all. You see, the same Holy Spirit that filled Peter and the apostles will fill us if we're following Jesus. Whoa, how do I get it? How does it work? Tell me more. It's all a part of God's rescue plan that we'll be talking about through the rest of the New Testament. But first, we need to finish the book of Acts. God was going to pick someone very unusual to carry the good news all the way to Rome. Someone the early believers were so afraid of, they wouldn't even let him in their homes. Someone absolutely perfect for the job. This young man was a Pharisee, a very strict Pharisee, and he thought anyone who followed Jesus should be arrested. 
or worse. So how does someone who thinks Jesus was wrong end up being the guy who spreads the good news of Jesus farther than anyone else? That's a good story. A uh, Sunday school lady? As Paul was traveling to Damascus, a bright light from the sky hit him, and he heard a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Paul fell to the ground and said, Who are you? And the voice said, I'm Jesus, the one you're trying to hurt. Meanwhile, in Damascus, there lived a man named Ananias, who was a follower of Jesus. He had a vision, like Peter on the roof, and Jesus shows up in his vision. Saul is the one I'm going to use to spread the good news about me to Jews and Gentiles and even to kings. So Ananias goes and finds Saul, and when he puts his hands on him, immediately Saul can see again. And Saul becomes a follower of Jesus and starts running around Damascus saying, Jesus is the Son of God. Wow, that's quite a change. He went from arresting people who believe in Jesus to telling people to believe in Jesus. Is that when they changed his name from Saul to Paul? No, his Jewish friends always called him Saul, and his Gentile friends always called him Paul. Luke starts calling him Paul in the book of Acts when he starts traveling among Gentiles. Paul started preaching and teaching in Damascus. He was so smart that no one could argue with him. The next 13 books in the New Testament are the Pauline epistles. Pauline? Who's she? I don't think it's a girl's name. Pauline is a girl's name, but that's not the way we're using it. The word Pauline means of Paul. And epistle? Epistle is a Greek word that means letter. So the Pauline epistles are the letters of Paul. Everywhere Paul went on his three big trips, people started following Jesus. All the Jesus followers in a city would meet together and form what we call a church, a word that means a group that assembles together. But Paul couldn't stay and keep teaching every one of these groups, so when they had questions about what Jesus taught or about how they should live as his followers, Paul would write them letters. Before they had the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, the churches needed help to know just what to base their lives upon. So Paul wrote them a letter. He'd write them once, he'd write them twice. And make the problem better with helpful hints and good advice. What'd they need? They needed. Letters of Paul, the letters of Paul. Some are short and some are tall. Tall? You mean long. But that doesn't rhyme. Letters of Paul, the letters of Paul. Some are big and some are small. Oh, I guess that works. Many of the ones he sent are now in the New Testament. And one and all, from big to small, can read and love the letters of Paul. Well, that's fantastic, but what are these letters? What? You want us to name every one? Yes, every single one. All right. Romans and 1st and 2nd Corinthians and then Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Next is Colossians and 2 Thessalonians. Someone should hang these up in the Smithsonian. Now up to Timothy 1 and 2, there's only two left for reading through. Titus Philemon, our last of all. Titus Philemon, so very small. Titus Philemon, the last of all. And, and those the letters, the letters of Paul. Great. Those are the letters. Yep, those are the letters. So, what do they say? Back to Paul. We are justified, given a new label, by grace as a free gift through faith. Faith? She lives right over... It's not the girl faith, it's the idea. Well, why they name so many ideas after girls? Um, I think it's the other way around. To have faith in something is to believe it is what it says it is, and that it will do what it says it will do. That's right. To have faith in God is to believe that he is who he says he is, and that he will do what he says he will do. But you can have faith in anything. I have faith in a chair every time I sit in one because I'm believing that it will hold me up. 
And I have faith in an airplane every time I get in one, because I believe it will take me up into the air and then bring me back down again safely wherever I want. So what do we have faith in, believe in, to get this free gift of righteousness? God? Kind of. Jesus? Closer. Jesus in a chair or an airplane? Nope. In one of his letters, Paul says he will not boast in anything. In other words, he won't say, I got this label of righteousness because I worked so hard, or because I'm such a good person, or because I go to church every Sunday. Nope. He says the only thing he can boast in is the cross of Jesus Christ. The power to justify us, to change our labels from sinful to righteous is in what Jesus did on the cross. You see, because Jesus is God, he has God's righteousness, perfect righteousness. Jesus is the only one who deserves to wear the righteous label, who could ever earn that merit badge. When he went to the cross, he took the stain of my sin. He took my label, sinful, and then he beat death. He destroyed the power of sin, and he gave me his label, righteous. His label makes me a child of God, a son of the King, and I can wear it forever. So as you're watching and learning, if you realize that you've never decided to follow Jesus, that you've never said, hey, I want to be a part of the kingdom of God, but you think you want to, talk to your parents or your Sunday school teacher or your pastor. If you're a grown-up, talk to another grown-up that you know follows Jesus. And keep watching, because we've got a whole lot more to learn. It sure is good to be done with all the letters, right, Clive? I don't think we're done with all the letters. What do you mean? He's right, Ian. We're done with the letters written by Paul, but those aren't the only letters in the New Testament. Paul's epistles start with Romans and go to tiny little Philemon. Then we have a big letter called Hebrews, and then James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and Jude. These seven letters after Hebrews are called the General Epistles. Because they were all written by generals in the army. Um, uh, no. Paul's letters were written to specific churches or specific people. They are specific letters. These seven letters aren't written to specific people, but to all Christians or all Jewish Christians in general. Hence the name General Epistles. So none of these letters were written to specific people or churches. Right. Um, except for 2 John, which may have been written to a specific church, and 3 John, which was written to a guy named Gaius. So why are they in the general epistles? All right then, moving on. Good day, world. It's time for the last book of the Bible, Revelation, a book that I'm hoping is easy to explain. Right, Phil? Well, maybe not the easiest book. According to this expert, Revelation is one of the most complicated books in the entire Bible. Oh, um, okay. Well, that's just one expert. And this expert says Revelation is one of the most difficult books in the entire Bible. Oh, dear. It's difficult. It's difficult. And, and very, very cryptic. cryptic. It's what we call. It's what we call. Apocalyptic. Full of symbols, dreams, and visions. Waves us with some tough decisions. What's this? What's this? Symbol represent. What's the? What's the? Message being sent. Crazy scenes from our creator. You might need your calculator cause in here you'll find it true that numbers, that numbers can be symbols too revelation what a trip i read it as i sail my ship these messages to john were sent if only if only i knew what they meant Ay, ay, ay. This stuff is crazy. 
Studying Revelation is like studying a forest. Each sign, each symbol is like a tree. If we stare too closely at each tree, if we get lost in the details, we miss what the whole forest is trying to tell us. We have to back up. We have to get in our helicopter and fly way up high to look at the whole book and ask, what is God trying to tell us? Well, what did you guys hear? Mm, let's see. It's clear that God is going to destroy evil and set things right, but he's been waiting. Right, but he's only going to wait so long. There will be signs and warnings, and then he will step in and end evil. And the closer we get to that time, it seems, the more trouble there will be for the church, because we have an enemy. Satan who hates us and wants the whole world to work against us. But Satan has already lost, beaten by the Lamb. The Lamb of God, that's Jesus, who, just like the Passover Lamb in Exodus, gave his life to save our lives. He paid for our sin, so we can change from God's enemies to God's friends. So Revelation is a warning and an encouragement. It warns us that we have an enemy who is always trying to hurt us, working through the powers of the world. And things are going to get worse before they get better. But Revelation is also an encouragement because the final battle has already been won. Even though the church will suffer, our future is safe with God. We have nothing to be afraid of. So how does it end? If we don't end up on clouds playing harps, where do we end up? Oh, this is the best part. After evil is destroyed, John looks up and sees a new heaven and a new earth, restored, redeemed, cleaned of all evil. It's the kingdom of God in full bloom at last. And it's heaven and earth together. And this is how the story ends. It started with a garden and ends with a garden city, the city of God, where there is no death, no tears, no sickness, no bullies, a resurrected earth cleaned of sin and evil, where we will live, work, eat, play, sing, and dance with the God who made us and loves us very much. The world is a messy place. Spend more than a day or two here and you're going to get hurt by someone or something. But this book tells us where that hurt comes from. Sin, rebellion, us wanting to be the ones in charge. It also tells us how we can be saved from sin by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It tells us about the wonderful work we can do spreading his kingdom, helping others, seeing ourselves become more and more like Jesus. And it tells us the really amazing ending when God's kingdom bursts into full bloom. And that is what's in the Bible. So what are you gonna do now? What do you mean, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna follow Jesus. I'm gonna help grow the kingdom of God. What else is there? Well, what about you? I'd like to be in the kingdom of God Where there's no crying, there's no dying It makes me want to applaud and say hey God You're fantastic and I am so enthusiastic We'll redeem creation and I get to share your invitation With everybody, with everybody I meet And now I'd like to whistle With everybody, with everybody I meet.
The fruit of the Spirit. When you have the Holy Spirit, you will produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Self-control. It's the Self-Control Game! Where each contestant has to show self-control if they want to win big! Round one! Our first contestant is Armin. And he's been given a mystery package. He has to resist the temptation of opening the package no matter how curious he gets. This looks familiar. Wait a second. Is this a Captain Karate Dinocop action figure? Huh? This is just an oddly shaped potato. You are eliminated! Oh no! Round two! In this round, Lydia must listen to Hans singing karaoke for 30 seconds without pressing the button that will release a bucket of mashed potatoes right on his head. This should be a breeze for Lydia, who always seems to have a level head. She might just be the one to win big today. People getting jealous of my robot. He's Uba. I'm Hans. I can't take it anymore! That was quick! And round three! It's down to our final contestant, Micah. What do we have in store for him, Jane? Well, PB, he's got his work cut out for him because he has to stay awake while listening to Mr. Turtle talk about potatoes! Potatoes come in many shapes and sizes. Some big, some small, some are oddly shaped. He has to show self-control right now, or he will be eliminated. Must stay awake. This might be a good time to tell the audience about our sponsors. The Self-Control Game is brought to you by Obadiah's Oddly Shaped Potatoes. And 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You are tempted in the same way all other human beings are. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted any more than you can take. But when you are tempted, God will give you a way out. Then you will be able to deal with it. In a shocking turn of events, Mr. Turtle put himself to sleep. Uh, huh? I guess that means Micah wins. Micah goes home with a copy of Hans Karaoke Hits and... A bag of Obadiah's oddly shaped potatoes. Hey, what are you kids doing in here? This is the janitor's closet. Let's talk. What did we learn? What does it mean to show self-control? Who won the self-control game in the video? How can we live out what we've just learned? Can you share a time when you had to show self-control? Was it hard or easy? Let's pray together. Let's thank God that He is always with us and ask Him to grow the spirit of self-control in us. Where's the music coming from? Is this some kind of game show? Are you guys rolling credits? Hey! Scram! The Monday Show! It's game time! Get up on your feet and play along! Let's play! Freeze dance! When I say freeze, you stop dancing. When I say dance, you dance around. Ready? Dance! Freeze! Dance! Freeze! Dance! Freeze! Dance! Freeze! Dance, 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 dance! Yay! Stop and go. When I say stop, you stop moving. When I say go, you move around. Ready? 
Go! Stop! Go! Stop! Go! Stop! Go! Stop! Go, 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 go! Yay! Where's Max? Can you find Max somewhere in this picture? When you do, call it out. Ready? Go! Nope, not there. Not there either. Not as easy as it looks. Hmm. There he is! You found him! Yeah! <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit. When you have the Holy Spirit, you will produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Faithfulness! In a world where fair-weather friends are everywhere... Hey! That's a cool hat! One of my friends? That was lame! We're not friends anymore! And gossipers betray the trust of others. I have a fear of toast. Please don't tell anyone. Your secret is safe with me. Psst! Gabe's afraid of toast. What a nerd! Betrayed! From the creator of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness, comes a tale of three friends. Friendship! 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 Who thought nothing could come between them. The Cat and Karate Dino Cop 3D movie is coming out. We have to go see it. We'll see it together. together. But when one of them forgot to do their homework... I forgot to do my homework. I can't go see the movie. But we had this planned for months. Ugh, we bought the tickets already. Their friendship was put to the test. Our friendship is being put to the test. Hey, I just said that. This wouldn't have happened if you didn't sleep through math class. I can't help it. Math is so boring. boring. A decision would have to be made. A decision has to be made. Come on, guys. Get your own lines. Sorry. We can't just leave him like this. You know how he is with math. 4 plus 12 equals... With time running out. 20 minutes until the movie. We don't have much time. Go on without me. I'm not going to make it. Would they abandon their friend? Or would they show? Let's do this. Faithfulness. 1 Peter 4.10 says, God's gifts of grace come in many forms. Each of you has received a gift in order to serve others. You should use it faithfully. What? Let's talk. What did we learn? What does it mean to be a faithful friend? How did Armin and Lydia show faithfulness to Micah? How can we live out what we've just learned? What is a way you can show faithfulness to your friends and family? How can we ask God to grow the fruit of faithfulness in us? Let's pray together. Let's thank God that He is always faithful to us and will never leave us. We need more power! We've got no more power! I'm giving it everything! It's not enough! Looks like our final mission, Captain. It's been nice serving with you. No, there must be another way. <gasps> the bathroom's on the utility deck! You gotta go? No, divert the power from the bathrooms to the main engines. It just might be enough. It's crazy, but I've taken power from everywhere else. Oh, come on! Yay! 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 That X 
extra boost was just what we needed. Oh, Captain Buck, you're a genius. Congratulations, uh, Captain what? Buck. Oh, uh, Pastor Paul. I don't know how you did it, but you're the first starship on record to escape a wormhole. We just needed to use the bathroom. I'm not sure what that means, but not only have you done something never done before, as of this mission, you, Buck Denver, have successfully brought the good news of Jesus to the entire galaxy! Well, I guess so. <laughs> you have saved the galaxy! Buck! 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 Oh, Buck! really? Buck! There was nothing. Buck! Buck! No, stop, stop, no. Back. Oh, Back. come on. It was no big deal. Back. <laughs> Back. Wait, what? Back. Where am I? You were daydreaming again and not answering your phone. You've reached Gospel Galaxy with Pastor Paul, a ministry of the Galactic Mission Board. Where are you calling from? Hmm? Out in space again? Yeah. Best save your dreaming for after work. We got phones to answer. You reach Gospel Galaxy with Pastor Paul, the Ministry of the Galactic Mission Board. Where are you calling from? You reach Gospel Galaxy with Pastor Paul, the Ministry of the Galactic Mission Board. How can I help you? You haven't received your tote bag? I can see why you're upset. I'd like to thank you for supporting our ministry, and I apologize for the delay in receiving your promotional item. Send through your name and address, and I'll get that tote bag right on its way. All right, bye now. I can't keep doing this. What? You don't like the Gospel Galaxy program anymore? Pastor Paul's great. He's making a big difference. It's me. I'm not doing any good at all. You just got a lady a tote bag. A tote bag she will enjoy for years to come. A tote bag to one lady. What's the problem? Buck doesn't think he's doing any good. But he got a lady a tote bag. Well, that's pretty good. It's not. It's nothing. Buck, what's going on? Ever since I was a little kid, I dreamed about doing something big for God, like Billy Graham or Pastor Paul. Well, you know, some people are big things, people. And other people answer the phones and send out tote bags. But I don't want to be a tote bag guy. I want to be a big thing guy. <gasps> your phone is ringing. Are you standing on your desk? Maybe. That's your phone. You've reached Gospel Galaxy with Pastor Paul. A ministry of blah, blah, blah. How may I help you? The signal's out? When did it happen? Two days ago? And where are you? Sector 9, Quadrant 7. Thanks for calling. We'll put a team right on it. There's a whole quadrant that can't hear Pastor Paul. Must be a bad transponder. Put in a tech request. That could take weeks. We can't wait that long. I gotta go to the boss. Wait. Pastor Paul? This is big, bigger than tote bags. To be continued. Will Buck do something big for God? Will the lady ever get her tote bag? And will Sector 9 get back online? Tune in next time for... Back in my day, we weren't allowed to go past Neptune. Episode 2, Captain Buck? That's next time on Galaxy Buck, Mission to Sector 9. Of the Spirit. When you have the Holy Spirit, you will produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Kindness. Welcome to Track and Field Day at Newly Elementary! Brought to you by Shrivel's Prune Juice! 
He's PB. She's Jane. And we're PB and Jane. We're all really excited for all the athletes who are running today. They look reluctant for physical activity, but it's gym class. They have no choice. PB, who do you think will be the fastest? I don't know, Jane, but I certainly don't want to be the slowest. Why is that, PB? You see, Jane, as the runners start the race, Chet, our very own school bully, will be released providing that extra bit of motivation they need to give it all they got. Sounds exciting and cruel. Ooh, it looks like Chet escaped. So they're off. Run for your lives! It's a good start for Micah. Looks like he's had some practice running from Chet. Interesting fact. Micah is Chet's favorite kid to beat up. And you can imagine what an excellent training program it is for him to run for his life every day. Oh, no. What do we have here? It looks like Gabe ah. has taken a tumble. Let's have another look at that in our slow motion instant replay. His shoes are on time. Next time, he'll have to try harder at crossing those bunny ears. Classic rookie mistake, PB. It looks like this is the end for Gabe, but wait. It appears he's getting a helping hand from his competitor, Micah. Another interesting fact about school bullies is they love the sound of lunch money. I can't tell if he's being brave or foolish. No, PB. He's being kind. Micah is using that to distract Chet away from Gabe. Well, that's it for track and field day at New Leaf Elementary. Looks like there's no losers in this race. We'll see you next year. I'm getting all misty-eyed. Philippians 2.4 says, none of you should look out just for your own good. Each of you should also look out for the good of others. Let's talk. What did we learn? How did Micah show kindness to Gabe? How can we live out what we've just learned? Share a time when someone showed kindness to you. How did you feel? What are some ways you can show kindness this week? Let's pray together. Let's thank God for His kindness toward us and ask God to help us be kind to everyone we meet. When I say dance, you dance around. Ready? Dance! Freeze! Dance! Freeze! Dance! Freeze! Dance! Freeze! Dance, 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 dance! Yay! Stop! And go. When I say stop, you stop moving. When I say go, you move around. Ready? Go. Stop. Go. Stop. Go. Stop. Go. Stop. Go, 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 go! Yay! Where's Max? Can you find Max somewhere in this picture? When you do, call it out. Ready? Go! Nope, not there. Not there either. Not as easy as it looks. Hmm, there he is! You found him! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit. When you have the Holy Spirit, you will produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Joy! Woohoo! Ice cream! This is gonna be good! Ah! Oh. Hey, Armin, what's the matter? My ice cream fell on the ground. 
Hmm. Sounds like you need some joy. Thankfully, I was looking on the internet and I found this. The Joy Hat 4000! I've got a bad feeling about this. Now I just need to press this and... Are you sure about this, Micah? And pull this. This feels funny! Oh. Ah! Armin, do you feel joy yet? Whoa, 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 whoa! What are you guys doing? Giving Armin joy with the Joy Hat 4000. This isn't working! Whoa. Well, you're looking in the wrong place. Try Psalm 1611. It says, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. You see, Jesus wants us to find our joy in knowing him. A lot of things can make you happy, like ice cream, or being right all the time, or getting straight A's, or an autographed CD of the dream, dude. Yeah, baby, baby, baby. Or even a Joy Hat 4000. But those things won't last. The joy that comes from Jesus lasts forever. I never thought of it like that. If my joy comes from Jesus, I can be happy even though I don't have any ice cream. That's right. And he wants us to show that joy to everyone. Let's talk. What did we learn? How did Armin and Micah try to find joy? Where does our true joy come from? How can we live out what we've just learned? How can we focus on the true joy that God gives us? How can we share that joy with other people? Let's pray together. Let's thank God for the true joy that comes from knowing and loving Jesus. Everybody needs some joy deep down in their heart. Everybody get down, everybody get down, everybody get down. Previously on Galaxy Buck, mission to Sector 9. Ever since I was a little kid, I dreamed about doing something big for God. You haven't received your tote bag? But I don't want to be a tote bag guy. I want to be a big thing guy. The signal's out. And where are you? Sector 9, Quadrant 7. I gotta go to the boss. Pastor Paul? This is big. Bigger than tote bags. Get ready for Episode 2, Captain Buck. Uh, sir? Yes, what is it? It appears we have a transponder down in Sector 9, Quadrant 7, sir. Well, put in a tech request. Yes, but that could take weeks, and there's a whole quadrant of people who can't hear your program, who aren't learning about God. Who are you? Buck Denver, sir, from the call center. I appreciate your enthusiasm, Buck Denver from the call center. But our two repair crews are both out in the field. We have a third ship, but no crew available. It will have to wait. Well, you probably don't know this, sir, but I've been training to be a ship's captain in my spare time. I've taken all the classes online in conjunction with an app on my phone. You're learning to be a deep space captain with an app? It's amazing what you can do with apps these days. All I've left is the final exam. A real mission under supervision, of course. So this could be my, uh, you know, final exam. Let me see if I'm getting this. You are to put together your own crew, take a ship you've never piloted into deep space, fix the transponder, and have it count as your final exam for your captain's license. Yeah, I know it's kind of weird, but 
but God wants us to do big things, sir. Nothing against tote bags, but, but this is what God wants me to do. Bring his word to all the people of Sector 9, Quadrant 7. I just need a chance. Hmm. Well, even if I were to say yes, I have no one to supervise you. All the crews are in the field. I think I have someone in mind, if it's not too crazy. Oh, Buck, that's absolutely insane. You have plenty of experience in space. But I haven't flown a mission in 17 years. It's like riding a bike. You never forget. I've never been in deep space. Back in my day, we weren't allowed to go past Neptune. It's all made of the same stuff. Uh, space stuff? God wants us to do big things, and I've been wasting my time with tote bags. Well, this is my chance. This is it. Oh, Buck, I'm not sure. For me? I don't know. For God? Oh. For the people of Sector 9, Quadrant 7? <laughs> We're going to space! What are you talking about? All of us. We're going to space to fix that transponder. You can fix a transponder, right? You guys are handy. We fixed a blender once. Same idea. But who's gonna be captain? Me! Don't worry, I've been taking classes on my phone. Pastor Paul says it's okay. Sunday school lady's coming along to supervise. <gasps> and when we're finished, I'll be a captain for real. It's sort of like a field trip. Yeah! To an alien planet! What could possibly go wrong? To be continued. Will Buck and his crew fix the transponder? Will Sunday School Lady finally go past Neptune? Will Buck ever get his captain's license? Tune in next time for... I haven't run since 1998. Episode 3, Hyper Jump. That's next time on Galaxy Buck, Mission to Sector 9. Of the Spirit. When you have the Holy Spirit, you will produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Gentleness. Just add some stars, then a dash of color, and voila! Armin the astronaut exploring the vast reaches of space! Hey, Armin, look what I made! That's a uh, nice. Uh... It's a hippo! You call that a hippo? Looks more like a blue blob! You sure your pen didn't explode all over your paper? <laughs> See ya, losers! Oh! Hey Gabe, don't worry about Chet. I like your art. You do? Sure. I mean, the colors are the wrong shade, and the lines are shaky, and the proportions are way off, and... I get it! It looks bad! Hmm, what should I do? Titus 3 verse 2, tell them not to speak evil things against anyone. Remind them to live in peace. They must consider the needs of others. They must always be gentle toward everyone. Hey, I've got an idea. How about I give you some drawing tips and we can make your hippo even cooler. Yeah! And maybe we can put hippo in space! I like the sound of that. Wow, wow cool. this is great! A flying hippo in space? Did you draw this, Gabe? Yep. You're the best drawer in class. Looks like you have some competition. Don't worry, Armin. Maybe someday you'll be as good as me. If you practice. <laughs> oh, oh, very funny. Let's talk. What did we learn? How did Armin show gentleness toward Gabe? How can we live out what we've just learned? Do you think it's hard to be gentle toward other people? What is one way you can show gentleness?
Let's pray together. Let's ask God to show us opportunities to be gentle toward other people and to grow a spirit of gentleness in us. Do do gentle Dennis, that's what they call me. Gentle Dennis, hoo ha, whoops! Hi, Dennis. Oh, is that box for me? Uh, yep. Uh, one box of uh, Frank Giles. Sign here. Oh, goody! You can never have too many test tubes. I can't wait to. Oh my! You know, kids. Sometimes life ain't so gentle. Like today. Box of fragiles. Who knew? Remember, when life gives you fragiles, it's fragile. This has been a message from Gentle Dennis. The Monday Show. It's game time. Get up on your feet and play along. Let's play. Freeze dance. When I say freeze, you stop dancing. When I say dance, you dance around. Ready? Dance! Freeze! Dance! Freeze! Dance! Freeze! Dance! Freeze! Dance, 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 dance! Yay! Stop and go! When I say stop, you stop moving. When I say go, you move around. Ready? Go! Stop! Go! Stop! Go! Stop! Go! Stop! Go, 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 go! Yay! Where's Max? Can you find Max somewhere in this picture? When you do, call it out. Ready? Go! Nope, not there. Not there either. Not as easy as it looks. Hmm? Previously on Galaxy Buck, mission to Sector 9. It appears we have a transponder down in Sector 9, Quadrant 7, sir. I've never been in deep space. Back in my day, we weren't allowed to go past Neptune. You probably don't know this, sir, but I've been training to be a ship's captain in my spare time. I've taken all the classes online in conjunction with an app on my phone. Buckle up for Episode 3, Hyper Jump. Ships nowadays are so automated, there's very little that could really go wrong. You see, guys? Just like I've been saying. Good heavens, they've gone metric. The buttons are different. It's all automated. You'll hardly have to push any. I hope I get to push some. What's the point of going to space if you can't push any buttons? Oh, dear. I'm patching in one of our engineers to talk through your mission. All right, you're on a transponder repair mission. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. See, I told you. The transponder in question is on the planet Talaris, Sector 9, Quadrant 7. Is that a nice planet? Most importantly, it's an uninhabited planet. No one lives there, so you shouldn't have any trouble. Well, that's a relief. You'll follow the beacon to the transponder unit. Talaris is a volcanic planet. Most likely, seismic activity knocked the polyneutronic power rod out of alignment. You'll realign it, get the unit back up and running, and then head home. <laughs> oh, Talaris does have some nasty sandstorms, so watch out for those. But no inhabitants. Nope, not according to our sensors. Are your sensors ever wrong? Hardly ever. Uh, on the outside chance that they were wrong, uh, that we did bump into some inhabitants, um, what should we do? Oh, that's easy. It's easy, see? 
Run. Hmm? Uh. Well, gotta get back to work. Enjoy! Did he say run? I haven't run since 1998. No one's going to have to run because this planet is uninhabited. That's what the sensors say. And they're hardly ever not very often wrong. Only occasionally. Oh, come on, guys. God wants us to do big things. This is a big thing. So this is what God wants us to do. And since God wants us to do this, he'll make sure nothing goes wrong. Are you sure that's how that works? It's on my poster. So fire up the engines and let's get moving. We've been moving this whole time. It's highly automated. In fact, we're just about ready to make our hyper jump to sector nine. Quadrant seven. All right, hyper jump on my mark. Five, four, three. Too late. The ship's already made the decision. To be continued. What will they find on Talaris? Will Ian ever get to push any buttons? Is Talaris really uninhabited? Tune in next time for... Maybe next time we should put on our seat belts before we hyper jump. Episode 4, The Sandstorm. That's next time on Galaxy Buck, Mission to Sector 9. the Spirit. When you have the Holy Spirit, you will produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Goodness. Dino jumping, dino standing, plus built-in dino talking action with Attitude, the Captain Karate Dino Cop action figure. I'm Captain Karate Dino Cop. Just go for it. Whoa, is that the Captain Karate Dino Cop action figure I see there? Yeah, my mom gave me this for my half birthday. She always gives me the toy I want because I'm such a good boy. Well, that's really cool. Could I see it? No, I don't like to share. It's mine. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to walk away from you now. Hans, you left your... Just go for it! Huh? Who said that? I'm Captain Karate Dino Cop with built-in talking action. You can do it! Do what? Are you saying I can take Hans's toy? That's stealing! Don't be a wimp! Just go for it! Do it! Hmm. Do it! Do what should it, I do? It, do, it, do it. Hey, Armin! What you got there? Hans dropped his Captain Karate Dino Cop action figure, and it's telling me to steal! You can do it! Just go for it! Uh, you do know you're listening to a toy, right? How about listening to what God says? James 4, 17. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. God says it's a sin to steal. So I shouldn't take this. I should give it back to Hans. Do the right thing! You said it, Captain Karate Dino Cop. I'm Captain Karate Dino Cop. Hans, I think this is yours. Oh, that old thing? Who needs it? Uba, destroys this plastic relic. Affirmative. Do the right thing! Oh, what a waste of a perfectly good action figure! I have the new toy. Sergeant Captain Karate Dino Cop. Goodness! Captain Karate Dino Cop, it's sold out in every shop. How could Hans let it drop? Goodness! Should Armin go for the steal when the toy speaks for real? No, he knew a better way! Armin was good today! Let's talk. What did we learn? When Armin had the chance to do what was right or what was wrong, what did he choose? How can we live out what we've just learned? Can you think of a time you had to choose between doing the right thing or the wrong thing? How did God help you?
let's pray together. Let's thank God that He is always good to us and that His Word promises us that He will work all things together for our good. The fruit of the Spirit. When you have the Holy Spirit, you will produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Peace. Peace. I love peace. No, peace. As in the fruit of the Spirit? That's a vegetable, Micah. Ah. Chill out. Have some peace, bro. Are you worried, anxious, scared of whatever's in your closet? How about the toes that's about to pop out? Now! Well, fret no more with peace. Peace? Peace! The truth and knowledge that God is in control over everything will help you overcome the fears of the world, which include toast! Ah! Philippians 4, 6-7 says, Don't worry about anything. No matter what happens, tell God about everything. Ask and pray and give thanks to Him. Then God's peace will watch over your hearts and your minds. I get it now! Through Jesus, I can have peace, so I won't be afraid of toast. I'm as cool as a blue bumper. Uh, don't you mean cucumber? Nope. Let's talk. What did we learn? What is peace? What is God in control of? How can we live out what we've just learned? What are some things that make you feel afraid? We can always ask God to give us peace when we are afraid. Let's pray together. Let's thank God for the gift of peace and ask Him to help us remember that He is in control of everything. I am looking for peace. Peace? What I really want is peace. Please? Oh, won't you listen to my please? Please appease my request. Previously on Galaxy Buck, mission to Sector 9. You'll follow the beacon to the transponder unit. You'll realign it, get the unit back up and running, and then head home. God wants us to do big things. This is a big thing, so this is what God wants us to do. All right, hyper jump on my mark. Five, four, three. Too late. The ship's already made the decision. <laughs> Prepare yourself for episode four, The Sandstorm. Next time, we should put on our seat belts before we hyper jump. Don't look at me. It was the ship. Uh, that must be Tolaris. It took us right there without pressing a button. But I wanted to press buttons. I wanted to press lots of buttons. Can we go back and do it again? No way. We're here. It's time to do something big to the shuttle. This place is really red! It's iron oxide, just like Mars. Why didn't we just go to Mars? It's a lot closer. That's not where the transponder is, Ian. Oh, right. Where is the transponder? We're tracking its beacon. The shuttle will set us down a couple hundred yards away. 
It sure doesn't look like anyone lives here. The sensors were right. It is uninhabited. All right, everyone. We're setting down. Hmm. According to the beacon, the transponder is this way. No, wait. That way! Are we really following him? It would appear so. Doing something big for God. I hope he knows what he's getting us into. No one lives here, right? The planet is completely uninhabited. Yes, but does anybody live here? Do you know what the word uninhabited means? Not exactly. It means no one lives here. Oh, good. So no one lives here? Hey, is that the transponder? No, the transponder unit is still about 50 yards away. Over there! See? We made it! If that's the transponder unit, what's that? It is a door, and on the door it says T-U, Transponder Unit. And it's covered with scratches, and the hinges have been pried right off. Wait, the hinges were pried off? That means... Red! Red! Wait, where are you going? Sub-1 or Sub-Fig rip that door right off its hinges! This planet is not uninhabited, Buck. That means it's time to run! <laughs> Wait! It was probably just seismic activity. Buck, earthquakes don't rip doors off and throw them 50 yards. There are creatures on this planet, which means we need to get off of it. <laughs> Ow! Well, you don't have to throw sand at me. I didn't throw sand at Ow! <gasps> it's a sandstorm, just like the said. What? Oh, man. Come on! Back to the shadow! But we're so close! The transponder is right there! God wants us to do big things. Remember my poster? It's too risky, Buck. They'll send another crew to fix the transponder. And I'll go back to handing out tote bags? Not gonna happen. God wants me to do big things, and I'm gonna do big things. Buck, come back. It's too dangerous, Buck. I can't believe he's doing this. We'll never find him in this storm. Let's wait it out in the shuttle and find Buck when it's all over. We'll be back for you, Buck. There it is. I'm going to realign the poly whatever power rod and get the transponder back online. Pastor Paul will be impressed. God will be impressed. I'll be doing big things for him. Okay, this is easy. Just need emergency power so I can see what I'm doing. Here we go. Ooh, good. Now, where's the power supply? Oh, here it is. See? No problem. Just realign the power rod. Uh, wait, where is it? The seismic activity must have knocked it right out. It's a glowing tube. Should be easy to spot. Hmm? Better idea. Security cameras record everything. They'll show me where the power source fell. Just play the last thing that was recorded? Aha! Uh -huh. An earthquake! The seismic activity! Ah! 
that wasn't seismic activity. That definitely wasn't seismic activity. This planet is not uninhabited. Hmm? What's that? Hmm? Who's there? Is that you, Sunday School Lady? I don't get it. The shuttle should be right in front of us. If we didn't take any wrong turns in the storm, which is very possible... We should have borrowed Buck's location tracker before we let him run off. Next time. We'll definitely do that next time. Yes, next time. Wait, I see something. That must be the shuttle. It's getting closer, but I'm not moving. That is not the shuttle! <laughs> to be continued. What happened to Buck? Will the crew get back to the shuttle? Who or what lives on Talaris? Tune in next time for... What? What? Where? Hey, what? Oh! Episode 5, The Hermit. That's next time on Galaxy Buck, Mission to Sector 9. So much love and joy and all the wonder, all because a little baby was born. Wait, you do know the story of the very first Christmas, don't you? I'm not talking about all the jingle bells and decorations, but the real story of Christmas. Oh, I need to introduce myself. I'm the hopeful world. You didn't think you'd get a chance to talk to the whole world today, did you? Oh, right! The very first Christmas! when we celebrate that baby Jesus is born. But this story really begins years and years and years and years before the very first Christmas with two men named Abraham and Isaiah. Did you ever hear about God's three promises to Abraham? Yes, I have. Well, maybe, kinda, well... No. <laughs> well, a long, long time ago, God promised Abraham three things. Number one, his family would become a great nation. <laughs> Number two, they would have their very own land, the promised land. <laughs> and number three, through that nation would come a blessing for the whole world. Whoa, yay! Whoa! Pretty great promises, huh? Really great promises. But then, something happened. Uh-oh! What? Jerusalem was destroyed, and the Israelites were stuck in Babylon, far away from the Promised Land. So, it seemed like... 
None of those promises are coming true! Israel was supposed to be a great nation. But now, they weren't a nation at all. How could a blessing for the whole world come from Israel now? We don't know! God's promises confused the Israelites living in Babylon. They wondered if these promises would still come true and if they could still trust God. Is our story over? Is this the end? Well, God knew how confused they were. So he sent the prophet Isaiah to give them one of the most important messages in the whole Bible. In the whole Bible? What was the message? It's not the end, Isaiah said. In fact, just wait till you hear what God is going to do next. Well, the Israelites were... Super excited! Yay! Why? Because Isaiah told them about... The Messiah! Wait, what's that? The Messiah? Messiah means anointed one. Samuel had anointed young David with oil, which means that he was being set apart by God for a very special job, to be king of all Israel. And now Isaiah was saying that there was another anointed one coming. A baby will be born. He will be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel, which means God with us. But he would also have another name. The baby would be from King David's family, and he would grow up to rule God's people forever. Wow, forever is like a really long time. It turns out the hope of the world wasn't a mighty nation or a big army. The hope of the world was going to be... A baby? <laughs> you got it. Now, can you guess the baby's name? Oh, I know, I know. Jesus. <laughs> wow, a baby? And what about that Isaiah? He was telling people about a baby who would save the world in the future. Boy, oh, baby boy. If only they had been around to see it, they would never have believed how the baby would arrive. But before we get there, we have to go back to God's three important promises. Do you remember God's three promises to Abraham? Actually, I do. His family would become a great nation. They would have their very own land, the promised land. And through that nation, a blessing will come for the whole world. Right. Well, after 1,500 years, two of those promises had come true. Amazing! And what about the third promise? You mean the promise of the blessing for the whole world? The one that promised the Messiah? The Anointed One? That's the one. Had that one come true too? Uh, no. Oh. Many years had passed since the time Isaiah had spoken about that promise, and the Israelites, well, you can imagine what they were saying. Where's the blessing? Where's the Messiah? Is he ever going to show up? Oh, we're, we're starting, starting to lose hope. hope. But then, something amazing happened. <gasps> really? What? In a village called Nazareth, there was a young woman named... Mary! One day, God sent an angel to give her a special message. A special message? What was it? The angel said... You will have a son. A son? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm not even married. Mary wasn't married yet. But she had promised to marry a man named... Joseph! Then, the angel said something truly amazing. The baby will be a blessing for the whole world. He will be the Son of God. 
That's the promise they were waiting for. Yes, Mary would give birth to the Son of God, the blessing for the whole world. That's so amazing! And if you were shocked to hear about this, you can imagine what Mary must have felt like. Why, you would think she would have passed out and fallen on the floor right then. Uh. But Mary was brave. She trusted God. And she said, I am the servant of the Lord. May this happen just as you have said. Wow! Mary really trusted God. Yes, she did. Then the angel said, The baby's name will be Jesus. Was this the Messiah the people had been waiting for? <laughs> you got it! I knew it! So then what happened? Well, when it was time for the baby to be born, Joseph and Mary traveled to a place called Bethlehem. Was that a long ways away? It was. And they got there by... A donkey! That must have been hard. I think so. And on top of that, when they got to Bethlehem, they suddenly needed a place for Mary to have the baby. Oh, did they look for a hospital? <laughs> they didn't have hospitals back then. What about a palace? I mean, the Son of God should be born in the best place, right? Well... They... Or the best hotel? All the inns were full. So, what did they do? Since all the inns were full, Mary had her baby in... <laughs> a barn? A barn, the blessing that Israel had been awaiting for almost 2,000 years, was born in a... <laughs> a barn! Oh my! Mary didn't have her baby in a fancy palace, or a nice warm inn. Nope. Jesus was born in a stinky, smelly barn next to cows and sheep and goats and chickens. <laughs> the promised blessing for the whole world had finally come, but he didn't arrive quite the way people expected. <laughs> How about that? Being born in a barn? So many animals and a cute little baby Jesus right there in the middle of them. Away in the manger, no crib or a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his feet at the stars in the sky. Look down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. Mm -hmm. Those stars in the sky looked down where he lay. Oh, look at all those stars! God kept his promise to Israel. The Messiah had come. And although he was born in a humble barn and not in a fancy palace or the best inn, God's kingdom celebrated in a most amazing way. Really? How? Like this! Angels! A whole bunch of them showed up, and they sang and celebrated the birth of the new king. King Jesus! And where do you think God's mighty angels announced the birth of his son? Oh, I know. That's easy. They probably announced it in the biggest cities to the richest, fanciest, most important people of the whole wide world. Like kings and queens. No. Powerful generals? Ah, guess again. Oh, really rich people? <laughs> nope. Maybe this will help. <laughs> Shepherds. 
L look Shepherds? Remember that God chose a humble barn for the birth of his son? Yeah, that is so weird. Right? I guess God doesn't do things the way we think he should. I guess not. So, the angels appeared in the middle of a field outside the city. That's right! They sang to shepherds. They did! Dirty, smelly guys. Hey! With dirty, smelly sheep. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. God wanted to show how his love is for everyone, even the most gentle and lowly. Yay! <laughs> Go. You will recognize the Messiah by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in a blanket and lying in a manger. Go and see him. God showed the world his power, who he really was. Not with an army, but with a baby. Not in a palace, but in a barn. Not to kings and rich people, but to us, shepherds. God's rescue plan was happening. His kingdom was on the move. He was showing that his way of working was not going to be the way that people expected. It was going to be different. Yes, that little tiny newborn baby. Born in a barn. Celebrated, celebrated by, by shepherds. Was going to turn the whole world. Whoa! Upside down. Upside down is right. Imagine that, watching sheep at night when, bam, angels appear. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare in room. In heaven and nature sing, in heaven and nature sing, in heaven and nature sing. The angels announced his arrival to the shepherds, but the stinky and smelly shepherds weren't the only ones who learned about the gift from God. Do you know who this is? Oh, that's baby Jesus. I can tell, because I know he was born in a barn. <laughs> yep, born in a barn instead of a palace. No one expected that. Do you know what else happened? Um... Oh, a whole bunch of angels and shepherds showed up to celebrate. <laughs> and that's not even the whole story. There's more? Oh, yes. Sometime later, some wise men from the east followed a bright star in the sky to Jerusalem. They were really excited. Where can we find the newborn king? We saw his star in the sky. We want to worship him. And, and bring, bring him, him gifts, gifts, too. When the people heard about a new baby king, they got really excited, too. And soon, the news reached King Herod. There was already a king? King Herod. And he was ruler over all the land. Well, when he heard all the talk about a new king, he got a little worried. So he called his counselors together. Counselors! I need to know where the child king is supposed to be born. <laughs> In Bethlehem. Aha! So Herod had the wise men brought to him right away and said, As soon as you find the child, let me know because I want to worship him too. Hmm. Okay. So the wise men continued on their way, following the star. That must have been so awesome! Their very own compass in the sky! That's right! Soon the star stopped over the place where Jesus was. Ooh! We saw his star in the sky. We bring gifts fit for a king. Gold! Frankincense! 
myrrh. And they bowed down and worshipped him. Wow! And then they went back to tell King Herod that they had found Jesus. Nope. What? Why not? God warned the wise men not to go back to King Herod. You see, Herod didn't really want to worship Jesus. He didn't? Not at all. Herod was jealous of the new baby king. So, after the wise men left Jesus and his family, an angel spoke to Jesus' dad, Joseph, in a dream and said, Take the baby and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, because Herod is looking for the child. Phew! So, Jesus was safe? Yes, he was. Yay! Jesus would grow up with his earthly parents in a faraway land, until it was time to begin the work his heavenly father had sent him to do. would fully experience Jesus' teachings, his miracles, his love. But let's save those stories for another time. This is the story of the very first Christmas, when God's son Jesus was born in a barn to be our savior and our friend. Have a joyful, hopeful Christmas, everybody. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Marsha, what are you doing? I'm practicing impressions. You mean you can sound like other people? Cool. Who can you do? Well, you, Coco. Really? I'd love to hear it. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Coco, a blue mug with a delightful, hilarious, quick-witted marshmallow co-host. That's pretty good. Who else can you do? I can do the announcer. Listen. It's Coco Talk, today's guest. Sammy the Slingshot to discuss the importance of accuracy. And our friend Fruitcake with a family recipe for shepherd's pie. Now our hosts, Coco and Marsha. Hello everyone. We are super excited for today's show. Sammy the Slingshot is here. Do you know who she reminds me of? David Slingshot. Like the David Slingshot? Yep, David the Shepherd who became David the King. His Slingshot. Oh, that's so old school. Not to mention Old Testament. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if the next guest on the show was the rock who flew out of the Slingshot and hit Goliath? We tried to book him. He's on tour with his rock band. So he's a rock star? Get it? David was another kind of rock star. He was outsized by Goliath and faced him with nothing but a slingshot, a stone, and faith that God would win. And he did. Wow. So it didn't matter that Goliath was bigger because God was on David's side. Nothing really matters because you have God on your side. Here's a reenactment. I wonder if slingshots ever get dizzy spinning round and round and round and round and round. Great question. Why don't we ask? <laughs> Out of time so soon? Well, Sammy, we have to swing back to you. And fruitcake, Marcia and I were really wanting to have that shepherd's pie for dinner. Wait, what are we having for dinner now? No idea. 
But we'll talk to you all next time on Coco Talk. Previously on Galaxy Buck, mission to Sector 9. The transponder unit is still about 50 yards away. Over there, see? We made it. Security cameras record everything. They'll show me where the power source fell. Aha, uh -huh. an earthquake. The seismic activity. <laughs> that wasn't seismic activity. This planet is not uninhabited. Get ready to meet the hermit. Episode 5. <laughs> what? What? Where? Hey, what? Huh? Um, hello? Clive? Ian? Sunday school lady? Um, is someone there? Uh, Marcy? Is that you? Uh, definitely not Marcy. Oh, dear Lord, help me. I was just trying to do something big for you. I didn't want to be eaten by an alien creature. Well, call me a smurgeon fern. You're from Earth, aren't you? I am. I am. Don't eat me. I'm nothing but head. <laughs> Heavens to Tarblin. I'm not going to eat you, Earth man. No matter how many times I patch that hole, things just keep falling through. And now an Earth man. Well, let's turn on some light and have a look at you. Yes, you are all head, aren't you? What do they call you, big headed Earth man? I'm Buck, Buck Denver. Buck, Buck Denver. Just one buck. Oh, I prefer Buck Buck. Why so far from home? All alone. I'm not alone. I've got a crew. Uh, well, I did. I'm on a mission to fix the transponder so Sector 9 Quadrant 7 can hear Gospel Galaxy with Pastor Paul. <gasps> oh, Gospel Galaxy. My favorite show. Wait, you listen to the show? Sure do. I got a tote bag around here somewhere. Until last week when the signal just fizzled away. I know, and I'm here to fix it. And then finally I'll be doing something big for God and I'll become a captain and my life will really matter. <sighs> At least that's what was supposed to happen. Until everything went wrong. The door was ripped clean off and there was a sandstorm and my crew ran off and it wasn't seismic activity, it was scary aliens because this planet isn't uninhabited like it was supposed to be and I'm just trying to do something big like God wants. <sighs> I'm doing my part. Why isn't he doing his? Hey, why'd you... What's that? It's my tote bag. Pick it up. Come with me. Didn't you hear what I said? I'm trying to do what God wants, but it's all falling apart. You're a follower of Jesus, right? You mean a Christian? I am. But how do you know about Jesus? Missionaries came to my home planet, Jowin. They told me about Jesus. That's why I'm here. You're in a cave because of Jesus? Exactly. Brace yourself. What? Oh, what'd you do that for? Pick up your bag. Why are we beating up plants? Why am I holding this bag? When I started walking with Jesus, he led me here. First, just to be with him. Focus on him, get to know him. Uh, hold the bag right there. And now he's given me a garden to tend. You mean these plants we're beating up? Not exactly. <laughs> it's a different sort of garden. Oh, for heaven's sake, hang on to the bag. And this is the big thing God has given you to do? Beating up plants in a cave? Tell me, Buck Buck Denver, how do you know God wants you to do big things? Everyone knows that. 
Everyone? Well, it's on my poster. Your poster? Yeah, see? God wants you to do big things. It's right there. That's why he made us, to do stuff for him, to save the world. Can I make one small change to your poster? I guess, but be careful, because it's very special. Hey, my poster! Why do you... That's better. What? God wants you... I need the other half. No, you don't. But this doesn't say anything. <laughs> that says exactly what you need to hear, Buck Buck. God wants you. Wants me to what? He doesn't want you to do anything. He just wants you. Wants me? He wants to be with you. He loves you, Buck Buck. Not because of what you can do, just because he made you. As a matter of fact, he loves you even when you aren't doing anything at all. Follow me. We've got a garden to tend. Wait, is this your garden? Not exactly. Tell me, Buck Buck, this dream, this big thing you were trying to do for God, was it bringing you joy, making you happy? Was it bringing your friends joy? Well, not exactly. But who says I'm supposed to be happy? I'm saving the world! I'll be happy when I've done something big. And the fruit of the Spirit is peace, joy, love. That's the Apostle Paul talking, Buck Buck, in the New Testament. If we're filled with the Spirit, walking with Jesus, we'll be filled with peace, filled with love, filled with joy, not later, not after we've done something big. But I don't... Your problem is you don't know what you are. I'm a big-headed earth man. Yeah, yeah. I mean your true nature. We need to take a little ride. What? In there? After you. To be continued. Will Buck figure out what God wants him to do? Can Buck tape his poster back together? What is this mysterious garden? Tune in next time for... They're beautiful. Episode 6, The Gloon. That's next time on Galaxy Buck, Mission to Sector 9. Praise Party, Episode 3, Jesus is My Best Friend. Today's verse is John 15, 12 through 13. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends.
Let's talk. What did we learn? What are some things that make a good friend? Which days of the week is Jesus there for you? How do we live out what we've just learned? How do you feel knowing that Jesus is always there for you? What are some ways that you can be a good friend? Let's pray together. Let's thank Jesus for being our best friend and ask for him to help us learn to be good friends to others. Previously on Galaxy Buck, mission to Sector 9. Why so far from home? All alone. I'm not alone. I've got a crew. Uh, well, I did. How do you know God wants you to do big things? Well, it's on my poster. God wants you to do big things. It's right there. That's why he made us, to do stuff for him. Hey, my poster! God wants you. We need to take a little ride. What? In there? After you. Get ready for Episode 6, The Gloom. I was like you once, Buck Buck. I thought God needed me to save the world. I thought I could save the world, that I had the power, if only I worked hard enough. So I worked hard, so hard it almost killed me, so hard it made me miserable. I thought I was a Baruba. Oh, uh, what? It's a Jowan fish, big, strong, fast. You don't mess with a Baruba. Like a shark back on Earth. Right, a shark. God shark. That's what I thought I was. If you aren't a shark, what are you? A whale? A barracuda? A swordfish? A gloon. A gloon? Push that button. Release the seeds into the water. Are we feeding something? Push it. I don't see anything. Give it a second. Whoa, is that a gloon? We Earthlings call those jellyfish. Jellyfish, I like that name too. Gloon, or jellyfish, can't choose their own course. They can't go anywhere or accomplish anything on their own. Well, what's the point of that? A gloon is carried by the current. It must trust the current to take it where it needs to be. Push that button again. Hold it down. And so are we. And so are you. But only when we're trusting the current. And the current is? God's will. God's love. God's plan for us. When we let go of our goals, our desires, our dreams, and just focus on God, walking with Jesus, the current of his heart carries us along. My life is no longer mine to worry about. God has my life suspended in the current of his love. Like a groon. Like a jellyfish. I'm not a shark. You are not a shark. And pretending you are only hurts yourself and the people around you. 
God isn't asking you to do big things. He's asking you to be with him. Trust him. Rest in him. The people around me. My crew. I gotta go find my crew. I was so worried about my dream that I left them in a sandstorm. Do you have a radio? I do. Let's get you closer to the surface and we'll ring them up. I'm sure they're all right. I'm ringing up the shuttle. They should be there, but they're not. Where else could they be? Um, Tolaris isn't exactly uninhabited, you know. Oh, no. I think I know where you'll find them. I'll give you directions. Wait, can't you come with me? It's time to try walking with Jesus for yourself, Buck Buck Denver. But I haven't learned enough. I just found out I'm a glue, not a baruba, like three minutes ago. You'll keep learning your whole life long, and I'll help. Here, take this. What is this? A deep space communicator. This one and its linked pair can open up a channel no matter how far apart they are. But only for a couple minutes a day. I've got the linked pair. You take this one. All right. I guess I'm ready to go. But how am I going to know what to do when I'm following Jesus? Is he going to tell me everything? As you learn to hear his voice, he'll tell you some things, but not everything. When in doubt, use the rule of love. Is that where I hug everybody? No, unless they need a hug. The rule of love is simply to put others first. If God puts someone in your path that you can help, help them. It's that simple? It's that simple. If God puts someone in my path that I can help, help them. The rule of love. All right, I'll give it a try. Now you better get going. Your friends are probably in a pretty tight spot. We're in a pretty tight spot. I'll say we are. We're in a cage, hanging in the air, over hot lava, surrounded by angry aliens. <laughs> to be continued. Can Buck find his crew and the power rod? Will Buck be a gloon or a baruba? Will Buck follow the rule of love? Tune in next time for... My, what luck! Why should I duck? Where's my truck? Episode 7, Buck's Big Choice. That's next time on Galaxy Buck, Mission to Sector 9. Marsha, what are you doing? Spring cleaning. Where'd you even get this stuff? Oh, here and there. I've never seen you wear any of it. Well, for some reason, floating around in hot cocoa all day, I never get cold. It's Coco Talk. Today's guest, Stone, the Super Slam Rockwell, with a message about miracles. And our friend Fruitcake with exercise tips. Now our hosts, Coco and Marsha! Happy Easter, everyone! Before we get to our hard-hitting interview, Stone the Super Slam Rockwell has challenged me to see if I can roll him over. Ooh, what do you get if you move him? I get to pick the music for the end of the show. But if I can't roll him over, then he chooses one of your songs? Do you really have your own music? Oh yeah, rock and roll. Amazing. Okay, let's do this. Are you ready to roll, Fruitcake? Okay, in three, two, one. Well, that does look 
look like a challenge. It is. I could use a miracle right about now. Oh, oh, you know what you remind me of, Mr. Stone, the Super Slam? Can I call you just Stone? You remind me of the big stone they put in front of Jesus' tomb when they buried him after he died on the cross. It was really hard to move, too. But when Jesus' friends went to see him, the stone was rolled away. <gasps> How did they move it? Asking for a friend. They didn't move it. And if you think that's amazing, get this. Jesus wasn't there. <laughs> Oh, that's right. The Bible says Jesus' friends found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they looked inside, they didn't find him there. Yep, Jesus had risen. That was the biggest miracle. He was alive again and is still alive today. That is amazing. You think you're amazed? After Jesus' friends left, they saw him walking along the road. They were so surprised. Jesus had risen. He had risen indeed. Are you okay? Maybe we should roll to a clip. Oh, right. Rolling! Whoa, you're really rolling. That rock and roll, if I ever saw it. Looks like we'll be hearing that Marcia song after all, Mr. Stone. Tell us, what's the secret for getting you to roll? Oh, man, we're out of time. Thanks for being here, Stone the Super Slam. And Fruitcake, appreciate you reffing. We really wanted to hear about your exercise routine. See you all next time on Coco Talk. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What happened to my song? Granite, gravel, quartz, and rhinestone. Gravel, pebbles, tons of soapstone. Previously on Galaxy Buck, mission to Sector 9. Push that button. Release the seeds into the water. They're beautiful. And so are we. God isn't asking you to do big things. He's asking you to be with him. Trust him. But how am I going to know what to do when I'm following Jesus? When in doubt, use the rule of love. We're in a cage, hanging in the air over lava, surrounded by angry aliens. Find out what Buck decides in Episode 7, Buck's Big Choice. I think this qualifies as a tight spot. How did we get here exactly? Oh yes, I remember. Buck Denver. Let's have an adventure. Do big things for God. It's my dream. And now he's run off, and we're going to be deep fried by E.T. Oh, to be answering phones again. Sending out tote bags. Verifying credit card numbers. What's that alien have? It's glowing. It's the power rod from the transponder. That's what Buck is out there looking for. It looks like the aliens are worshipping it. I wonder if we'll ever see Buck again. I'm pretty sure we will. How do you know? Because he's right there. Hi, Buck! Don't blow his cover! Oh, um... My, what luck! Why should I duck? Where's my truck? Stop it, they don't even speak English. I don't need this. God doesn't want me to do big things. He just wants me to walk with him. And I found my friends. I can rescue them. But maybe God wants me to have both. Now that I've given up my dream, 
maybe he wants to give it back. That'd be just like God. I can walk with him and have my dream. <sighs> hey. What is going on down there? Oh, fuck. What are you doing? <laughs> Let it go, Buck. Give me my dream back. Continued. Will Buck rescue his crew? Will the crew get deep fried by the aliens? Will Buck finally get to do big things for God? Tune in next time for. Now about my friends. Hello. Episode 8 Mission Failure? That's next time on Galaxy Buck, Mission to Sector 9. Spirit. When you have the Holy Spirit, you will produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Patience! Ah, uh, the library. My favorite place. Nothing like being surrounded by books filled with information and knowledge with no one to bother you. <coughs> huh? Do you mind? <coughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want some? Um, no thank you. Huh. More for me, then. <sighs> Just keep calm, Lydia. He's going to run out of chips sooner or later. Ah, it has come to thee, lone potato chip. As your salty comrades have fallen, one question remains. Will you be as delicious and as crunchy? Only one way to find out. Well, at least it's over now. Can't you take that literally like anywhere else? Hey, Lydia, would you keep it down? This is a library, you know. <laughs> Ephesians 4.2 says, Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Well... There you have it, kids. Lydia did not show patience. As a result, she disrupted the library, and now, detention. Also, Mike has got detention for eating chips in the library. You shouldn't do that. Let's talk. What did we learn? What is patience? Why do you think it was hard for Lydia to show patience? How can we live out what we've just learned? Like flowers grow in a garden, God can grow the fruit of the Spirit in us. Talk about a time when God gave you the patience you needed. Let's pray together. Let's ask God to always give us the patience we need, and let's thank Him for always being patient with us.
When you practice patience, good things happen. For instance, steeped tea, dry paint, grass grows, oatmeal thickens. Previously on Galaxy Buck, mission to Sector 9. We're in a cage, hanging in the air, over hot lava, surrounded by angry aliens. <laughs> Give me my dream back! Let it go, Buck. <laughs> Find out now in Episode 8, Mission Failure? No! I can get it! No, Black! I can get it! It's my dream! God wants me to do big things! No, Buck. God wants you. The current is God's love. God's heart. Trust the current. How will I know what to do? The rule of love. If God puts someone in your path who needs help, help them. It's good to be off that planet and headed home. It was great how you saved that alien. Right, and us too. I'm sorry we couldn't complete the mission, Buck. I know being a captain was your dream. You know, I'm a gloon, not a baruba. Oh, uh, what? I'm a jellyfish, not a shark. A new friend taught me that drifting in the current of God's will, letting him choose my course, is better than any dream I could ever come up with. That's the wisest thing I've ever heard you say, Buck. Wait, when did you have time to make a new friend? I'll explain later. Let's head home. There's phones to answer and tote bags to send. Let me push the button. Too late. The ship did it. I don't like this ship at all. You've reached Gospel Galaxy with Pastor Paul, a ministry of the Galactic Mission Board. Where are you calling from? You've reached Gospel Galaxy with Pastor yeah, Paul, a ministry of the Galactic Mission Board. Where are you calling from? Down the hall? Uh, who's calling? Pastor Paul? Do, do you need a tote bag? Oh, I'll be right there. It's me, Buck Denver. Uh, yes. I hear the mission was not a success. Uh, no. Tolaris is not uninhabited. I was not able to fix the transponder. I'm sorry to hear that. It's okay. I don't need to be a captain unless God wants me to. I know that now. I have peace. And even a little joy for the first time. I knew Talaris wasn't completely uninhabited, for a very old friend lives there. You may have met him. Wait, what? I was the first missionary to a small planet called Jowen. I brought the stories of Jesus. You were that missionary? I still talk to him quite frequently. I can't believe this. 
Well, believe it or not, Regis spoke this morning and he believes you learned exactly what you needed to learn, Captain Buck Denver. I'm sorry, what did you say? We need leaders who follow God's heart, not their own. Who trust God's plans, not their own. We'll put together the crew you need and get you on your way. I've already got the crew I need. How do we look, people? All stocked and ready, Captain. Our new engineer disabled the autopilot so Ian can push the buttons. I am so ready to push a button. New engineer? First engineer Pete, at your service. Welcome aboard, engineer Pete. First mate Sunday school lady? Captain, our mission is logged and we're ready to fly. I'm proud of you, Buck. Jelly on. Jelly on! Wait! I didn't push the button! Oh! You wanted me to disable the autopilot now? Oh man! Can we go back and do it again? Here! Push this button! <laughs> can I do it again? Once is enough! What did I say? <laughs> that was fun. Do not touch it again. Ow! Seatbelts first! Love that video.